I'm going to call the Board of Selected meeting to order for Tuesday evening, March 30th, 2021. This meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access. Pursuant to an order issued by the Governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the Town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting. In accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all, the, all other participants of said recording. If anyone is or plans to record this meeting, including taking still pictures, could you please identify yourself at this time by raising your hand? Okay, seeing none, uh, this evening members of the board who will be participating remotely are myself, Mary Power, Joe Fisher, and Bill Ramsey. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us this evening. We're actually starting an hour early tonight because we actually have a very full agenda and uh, we thought it was important for many reasons that uh, we be able to start and conclude our business uh, at a time when uh, those participating uh, are, uh, are, are able to do so. Uh, we just were afraid things might get a little late. Uh, this evening, just uh, to let people know, we're gonna spend uh, from now until just a little bit after seven um, on several business items as noted in our agenda. Uh, shortly after seven o'clock, we will actually be uh, undertaking one of our board's um, most important responsibilities, which is the interviewing of uh, six uh, candidates for police sergeant positions. Um, as many of you know, the Board of Selectmen also acts as your police commissioners. And among our responsibilities are the hiring and promotion of uh, all patrol officers and all members of the Hingham Police Department leadership team. So that'll be, uh, that'll be getting underway in just about an hour. Uh, to start, we have three sets of minutes. Uh, Joe and Bill, I was not able to finish my review of the March 9th minutes. Uh, I'm ready to act on March 2nd and 4th, but I'm also, uh, uh, if, if anybody uh, wants to defer any other minutes, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I would, um like to defer the minutes could we defer them to the thursday meeting and make sure they're on the agenda on for thursday so that we can actually vote them on thursday uh that would be great michelle uh i i believe that uh in accordance with open meeting law we have until seven o'clock to modify our agenda so if you could put all three sets on for this coming thursday that would be great thank you that. thank you no problem joe um the next item of business on the agenda is a discussion and vote to postpone the Town of Hingham Annual Town Meeting under Massachusetts General Law Chapter 39, Section 9, and all other applicable laws. Uh, Tom, this uh, we've chatted about this sort of informally. Tonight is a formal vote and some definitive dates. Um, if you could just take a moment and uh, uh, share with the community what you're recommending to the board. Sure. So this is actually the same, uh, the same action taken under the same law as last year. It's delaying town meeting. Um, the uh, last year's uh, law that was passed by the legislature allowed for this to, to take place um, up through the end of, uh, of 2021, I believe. So we're, we're still within the scope of that original law. And what it does is uh, allows the boards of selectmen to delay town meeting to a date that, um, that works for for the town. Uh, the reason that we would want to do this is so that again, as we have for the for the fall town meeting last year and last year's spring meeting was to be able to hold it outdoors um, for safety purposes. So as not to have to bring a crowd into it in, into an enclosed indoor space during the pandemic. So what I'm recommending is that you would move town meeting um, from April 26th through to May 8th. Uh, that would be a Saturday. I would recommend we start that meeting at 2 p.m. And with we would have we would have rain dates set not for the following day, which we may May 9th because that's Mother's Day, and I don't want to have get skewered which pit, with pitchforks outside Town Hall. So I'm recommending instead that we have the rain date set for the 15th and 16th, which is the following weekend. Um, so so at 2 p.m. Uh, 2 p.m. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, Joe or, or Bill, any questions for Tom about the um, change in date for the annual town meeting? Do we need any um, state approval 
uh, legislative approval or gubernatorial approval to make this change? No. Um, and I assume there's going to be a, a subsequent discussion about the town election. Um, yes. And in that circumstance, do we need state approval? No. Because okay, so I thought last year we had made the change pursuant to um, either the governor's order or pursuant to some sort of legislative order. So, so we have a legislative order that has passed at uh, the state legislature and signed by the governor three weeks ago to move elections um, for in this calendar year. So we'll be we would be using that law for the election uh, the election delay, and we're using last year's law for the um, for the town meeting postponement. But uh, there's no there's no additional action needed by the state. Okay, got it. Thanks. Uh, I, mean, I think the dates that you proposed make sense, um, and given um, uh, the COVID situation and really our preference not to have meetings. Um, inside buildings at this point, uh, I think it's very prudent. So uh, I, I do support this. Great. Uh, Bill, any questions or comments about the date change? No, I anticipated the date changes and I just hope this year it's not 95 degrees out like it was. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are going to be recommending a series of, um, of uh, guidelines for people to, to come to the meeting as we did last year. And that will include Bill sunscreen and hats. <laughs> and flip flops. <laughs> I, I was a crazy guy wearing a suit last summer. <laughs> um, yeah, and Tom, my understanding is that the um, is that the that the legislation that was enacted last year by the gover governor is actually permanent, and this gives us the ability to modify our town meeting date um, into perpetuity. Is is that correct? I was under the impression it was just for through the end of the um, state of emergency or the end oh. of 21, but I, but I may be wrong about that. You know what? I, think, I, I, I know think we can right. do it now. Yep. Put it that way. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. You know what? Yeah. I, I think you're right. Um, thank you. I, I stand corrected. Thank you. Is there anyone in the public who has a question? And, and we're going to get to the election in just a minute, but who has a question about the uh, change in date and the postponement of the annual town meeting? Uh, seeing none, I would accept a motion. Uh, whereas the Board of Selectmen has determined that it is in the best interests of the residents of the town of Hingham to hold the Hingham Annual Town Meeting outdoors and during the day to protect the public health of the inhabitants of the town of Hingham during COVID-19 public health emergency. Now, therefore, the Board of Selectmen hereby votes to delay the town of Hingham Annual Town Meeting from Monday April 26, 2021 at 7 p.m. until Saturday, May 8th, 2021 at 2 p.m. outdoors at Hingham High School with rain dates of Saturday, May 15th, 2021 at 2 p.m. and Sunday, May 16th, 2021 at 2 p.m. pursuant to Mass General Law, Law Chapter 39, Section 9. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Okay, next item of business on the agenda is a discussion and vote to postpone the Town of Hingham election under Chapter 5 of the Acts of 2021 and all other applicable laws. Uh, I would just note that we are joined by uh, Town Clerk Eileen McCracken. Um, Tom, per perhaps you could give an overview of, of uh, how this came to be and, and perhaps just a little more detail on Joe's question with respect to um, the authority by which the, the town, you know, the, the, the authority that's been uh, given to the towns over the last few weeks. Sure, so the legislature had um, started, initiated an, an effort a few weeks back to, uh, to be able to allow towns to delay elections, understanding and recognizing that towns were in fact going to be delaying town meetings. Um, that that effort went through their legislative process cleanly and came out the other end uh, ready for a signature by the governor, which was uh, provided, I believe, about two weeks ago. Um, that process allows towns, like I said, to delay town meeting, uh, excuse me, elections. Um, the important piece of this is that if towns were going to be delaying town meeting like they are, then you, most towns want to have the election following the town meeting so that the sitting officials uh, in those communities are available to um, 
to a town meeting for the year that they prov provided their service. So, um, so that's, uh, I think in part what, what the legislature was thinking and why the governor wanted to get that through. Um, and they did that a couple of weeks ago. So, um, Eileen is here to make this formal recommendation, but this is, um, that's what, that's what it is. Eileen, welcome. And your recommendation Hi. is drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> this is the answer you've been waiting for. Uh, it will, <laughs> Saturday, May 22nd is when the town election will be held. Okay. And it will be the regular hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay. Um, and um, Eileen, with respect to um, polling locations, what do we know right, uh, right now? We will continue to have the three polling areas that we've had before. Precincts 1, 2, 3, and 4 at the high school. Um, five and six at the middle school and 5A at Linden Ponds. I'm not sure about Linden Ponds. I will check on that though. Okay. And um, I know we had a conversation yesterday uh, with respect to mail-in early voting. Is that something that's been decided yet that we can announce to the public or is that something uh, that is still under consideration? No, mail-in early voting is available. So okay. they and I, I have um, contacted the candidates and told them that it's available. And there is a form online that they can fill out and send in and start the process. Terrific. So this will be for, for members of the public who are watching this. The, the procedure we will use for um, mail-in early voting is exactly what was done last year for the town elections when everything was closed. So those of you who wish to participate in voting and would prefer to vote by mail as you did last year, that option will be available. For those of you who care to vote in person, that option will be available, obviously at your precinct. Um, Bill or Joe, any questions for Eileen or Tom relative to this uh, postponement of the town election? Um, Eileen, uh, I've got two questions um, or three questions. Um, First, uh, is there any impact on the budget uh, by delaying the, the date? I, I don't see any, but I just want to make sure that, that there's nothing that, I, that we haven't thought about. I can't think of any. It, it'll just be a, a um, we'll probably have more of the early voting than we normally would have absentee for a town election. Yeah. But that's the only thing. So it would be postage. Great. Um, and how do the residents of town find out what their precinct is? They can go on our website and find out, <clears throat> excuse me, and of course they could call the office too. Great. Um, and I guess my final question is if we extend the election deadline even further, does that mean we keep you in office for just a little bit longer? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'll be here. Oh, good. Thank you. And same uh, goes I, to you, Mary. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Eileen and I have some plans. No, I'm we sure. have some plans. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have no Bill, other questions. Bill, any questions for Tom or Eileen? Uh, no questions. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to hold the election after town meeting for a lot of different reasons. Yes. Um, I would just add that um, uh, we have been actually working with uh, Senator O'Connor and Representative Moschino. Um, people may recall about a month ago, the board actually signed a letter making a request for a home rule petition. Um, that, was, that was our attempt to try to um, put something forward should this legislation that applies to all municipalities um, somehow not happen in time. Um, and while it was not necessary, I think the board and the town would like to extend our thanks to Representative Moschino and to Senator O'Connor's office, uh, particularly to Greg Denton, who really just kind of bird dogged this through and kept everybody updated on what was going on. We, we know there are a lot of moving parts uh, in Beacon Hill right now, and we appreciate the support of our, uh, of our legislative representatives. Is there anyone who has a question or wishes to make a comment with respect to the postponement of the town election? Seeing none, I'd accept a motion. Sure, I'll make a motion to postpone and reschedule the Town of Hingham annual election from Saturday, 
May 1st, 2021, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to Saturday, May 22nd, 2021, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., pursuant to Chapter 5 of the Acts of 2021. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Terrific. Eileen, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you. Uh, next item of business on the agenda is a Weir River Water System billing transition discussion. Um, while we serve as water commissioners, we're, we're actually, this is not a policy matter we're taking up tonight. Uh, this is more of just uh, information and communication to our residents who are customers of the Weir River Water System. Uh, we're joined this evening by Superintendent Russell Tierney, who is just going to walk the board and walk the public through a billing transition that will be beginning at the end of this week that um, all ratepayers should have received a letter about, but uh, Russ is here to provide some, uh, some of those details for us. Welcome Russ and thanks for being here tonight. No problem at all, Mary, thanks for having me. Hopefully Michelle gave me permission to share screen. I'm sharing the screen now, I can't do it. We can see it, Russ. We can see. But you're muted, Russ. We can't hear you. Is that better? Sorry, push on. Um, as everybody's well aware, um, Suez took over operations back in August. And during that time since then, we have been transitioning all the billing accounts and customer service accounts over to Suez's own billing system uh, with the help of Aquarian. Uh, the good news is uh, effective April 1st, 2021, we will officially take over customer service and billing from Aquarian and it will be under Suez's contract until further notice. There is a brand new phone number for everybody and we will have one phone number going forward, which is 1-877-253-6665. You call that phone number for everything that you need for the water system, whether it be billing, emergencies, uh, new services, shot offs, meter replacement, all those things are all gonna fall into one phone number with a three uh, person customer service um, team in, in hand. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. So very important information for everybody in the town in Hingham and Hall, uh, customers of the Weir River Water System. We have limited account access from April 1st, 2021 through April 11th, 2021. This is due to the extent of data transfer and startup of the billing and customer service system. You will have limited access to, our, to your account information. However, if you call the 800 number, uh, the representatives from Suez and representing the Weir River Water System, be able to look at your account in a different manner and get you back answers that you need. It won't be as instantaneous as when we get the full system up and running, but they will be able to have access to them. It just won't be instantaneous access for the first few days. Customer service staff will be available beginning April 1st, 2021 to answer any questions regarding your account. There will be absolutely no interruption in your water and or customer service during this time. All payments received during this period will post on April 12th. So if you send payments in from now until then, they will be held off on posting as the system is up, get up and running. At this time, the Weir River Water System and its Board of Water Commissioners would like to thank everybody for their patience during the transition. And uh, again, effective April 1st, we will be taking over everything away from Aquarian. What does this mean to everybody? <clears throat> again, and I can't stress this enough, there's going to be a brand new phone number for everyone to call, which is 1 877 253 6665. This will take care of all of your customer service needs. There's a new customer service center that's opening up on, at 185 Lincoln Street, Unit 200B in Hale. The hours of operation of the service center will be Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's with most towns in, in Demera, Hingham, and, I, and I'm not even sure if Hall is open late too, but we will be open late on Tuesdays from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. In addition, there will be a mail slot installed at the door at the office in, on Lincoln Street, which will allow customers to even go there after hours and drop, drop off their bills. Um, and I will let everyone know we are working on a mailbox type receptacle at Town Hall. Um, there's been an issue with getting them because they're out of stock, which doesn't surprise anybody. 
but I am working with uh, Town Hall and we will get that installed as soon as possible. The residents will also have the option to talk them on Town Hall like they do with Tingham Light and other um, information they drop on the Town Hall and the Town Hall box. You will receive a new account number. The transition will be easier than when we did the first transition because the account numbers lie with Suez and the new ones will also. So they will have very easy access to all the account numbers. Anything that will be cross-referenced with both account numbers for the first three months, just to make sure everything's perfectly done. Customers will need to contact their bank if you do direct debit or home banking, just to make sure that you update the account number. And the new account number will be reflected on the first bill you receive. On your very first bill, you'll get that new account number. The 800 number also has 24-hour self-service options. Um, mainly and most importantly, that if you have an emergency, whether you witness a model main break, something in your home, call this 800 number and they will contact someone immediately to respond to an emergency. You can make payments. You can request copies of your bill off this 24-7 um, service. You can register for direct debt. You can uh, drop a meter reading, uh, look at your account information. So there's a lot of things that this 24-hour uh, self-service option can do. In addition, you can log into the website um, and that's on the next page a little more in detail. Then you go and register at mysuez.com, mysuezwater.com. Um, there will be a link through the Ware River Water, Water website to mysuezwater.com, just to make it easy for the residents and customers of the Ware River Water System. On this, you can manage your account, receive electronic bills, you can set up automatic payments, you can store payment methods, you can view your billing and update payment activities. And then the biggest uh, thing for this is to make sure everyone updates their contact information and this will uh, be used directly for re receiving emergency alerts. There's no third party uh, system involved. You don't have to go to someone else's website and drop, put in your personal information. They'll all be taken directly from the uh, billing and customer service database. So the best thing to do is get it in there. And I'm working with Suez now to count to about at least three phone numbers. So if there's you know, a few people in your home, you can actually have a few more phone numbers to contact during an emergency. They will also email uh, individuals and text messages. So those three things will be options when you go in the side up. Then the payment options. <clears throat> and please make sure you update your bank to reflect the new account number to make sure your payments are being properly, um, properly um, addressed to your account. And the payment options include, again, pay by check, direct debit, in person at the new office. And the bottom one I can't read because uh, the thing's in my way. But uh, it, there, there's all kinds of ways to pay. It's going to be a much better and a much more robust system than we're working with. That's about it. Um, if anybody have any questions. Um, maybe we'll start with Bill. Bill, any questions for Russ? I have no questions, Russ. Thanks for doing the presentation. No problem. Uh, Joe, questions for Russ? Russ, so that um, toll-free number that you gave, does that go directly to your cell phone, to your home? Yes, actually does. Um, it goes directly to the Suez uh, 3, then it goes to an emergency service, which... Russ, I can't hear you. What happened? Hold on. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. I don't know what happened. Um, so uh, it goes directly to Suez, and then it goes um, to their on-call people. Yep. And then they also have a... Um, um, and the number will also transfer to the treatment plant if there's any backup in the system. So if there's some issue with the system, it'll actually bring it to water period. So there's three ways of getting to Suez. Um, with respect to payments, mm -hmm. right, right now, I believe residents are sending checks to Aquarium. Right. Um, so from starting April 1st, if we have a bill that mm -hmm. is due and that the invoice says to pay Aquarium, do we should we be mailing those checks to Aquarian? Do we hold on to those checks? What 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 do we do? Well, that's a great question. So I'll get that updated, add it to this, and then I'll post this tomorrow on the website. Um, I believe we're going to mail them directly to Suez. Could you um, could you yeah. lead in because I'm I'm still having difficulty. Oh, oh, is that better? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I will look into that tomorrow morning. I, they're going to go to Suez. I know that. But if you get a bill that still has the uh, Aquarian address on it. Yeah. I'll add that to this presentation, which will be posted on the website tomorrow. So this entire presentation will be on the website, but people are just going and right. look at it. Okay. Um, I am going to also add another slide to this tomorrow morning, 
I've been buttoning up some uh, frequently asked questions. Um, and I'm going to add that slide to this tomorrow too. So it's going to be a okay. few things to do. So just so I'm clear, there are people who currently have invoices yep. from the Wear River Water System that says on the invoice to pay to Aquarian. Yes. Are you, are you suggesting that they hold off on those invoices? No, nope. nope, they can them? pay them. They pay them. Aquarian's been instructed. They, they're going to do what they do and get okay. them into our account. So you, that, that's your question. Yes. No, just send it in. Just okay. So in. Money, money should be paid and right. residents uh, or water uh, customers will be credited. Uh, based on those payments, whether it's going to Aquarian or to the new system. Is that correct? Okay. Yep. Uh, and then on the billing system, um, one of the options is a, it looks like it's going to be a credit card. Do you yeah. know whether users will be charged a fee for using uh, a credit card? I do not know that, but I'll write that down and definitely ask that question to okay. more. So for example, for HMLP, if I pay mm -hmm. my electric bill, there is no fee. Mm -hmm. For other town services, if I use a credit card, there is a fee. So uh, residents will want to know if there's a fee associated with us using the credit card. Uh, and I believe, I believe, Joe, that this will be similar to HMLP, where there will not be a fee. Well, um, if you pay, if you pay a bill through the town, it's through this, um, it's through Unipay, and the processing fee is is added to the amount. But um, because this system is 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 a Suez platform, I don't believe there's a charge. That's that's very good news. I know a number of residents will be very pleased with that. And Joe, I'll add that, I'll add that to my recent, you know, uh, questions page. We'll have that on the website tomorrow morning. Sometime. Great. Uh, and I assume you'll you'll confirm Mary's belief with the Suez before yep. posting it. <laughs> yeah, I just I actually did. I, I just made myself a note. I got it. Great. Great. Uh, I mean this is not a trivial task. This is um, complicated, important, um, both fiscally for the town, as well as fiscally for each resident to make sure it's being handled right. So uh, really, thank you for this. This is this is a great job. Yeah, um, I would just add uh, that, you know, for many residents, um, prior to the town taking over ownership of the water system, many ratepayers uh, actually had a had a you know direct debit through through Aquarian, and we know that during this transition period, um, that was something that you missed having, and so you will now be able to do that. And those of you who also paid by credit card will be able to pay by credit card. Mm -hmm. um, Russ, uh, would it be possible to send a copy of this presentation to Hull and to Cohasset as well? Um, I know you've been doing a great job liaising with, uh, you know, with, with those communities, but this is really helpful information. And mm -hmm. I think we want to make sure that all of the ratepayers, regardless of which municipality they live in, um, have access to this information. Yep. So, so we've sent the other information that we posted on the Hingham website and on the Wear River Water website went to Hingham and uh, Holland Cohasset to post on their website. So the, the letter and all those, all that stuff went there. And then um, I was planning on as soon as I had the questions to this and, and do a few more things to the presentation, I'll send it over to them also. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no. Is there any, is there anyone in the public? Uh, and I do note and welcome uh, members of the press who are here this evening, mm -hmm. who have any questions with respect to the Weir River Water System billing transition. Uh, I'm not going to call people out by name, Carol and Wheeler, um, but I would just say that um, you've both been really good partners with the town in terms of communicating important information. And if, if you had an opportunity to um, publicize this transition, and again, we're happy to um, send you print versions of any of the materials you've seen, uh, that, would, that would just be very helpful. As Joe said, it will, it will not only help the water system, but it'll also help with all of our rate payers. Um, terrific. Russ, I think we are all set. Uh, we know that the next 10 days will be uh, a lot of important work is going on. We thank you for that. We thank uh, Suez. We thank the Transition and Evaluation Committee. Uh, and I would also be remiss if we didn't thank uh, Aquarian for being willing to maintain billing operations over the last eight or nine months. Uh, without their cooperation in this manner, we wouldn't have been able to make the transition as quickly. 
Uh, so we we appreciate everybody's efforts to to get us to the point where uh, to to get us to the point that we're at. Mary, I'd like to thank the uh, Citizen Advisory Board too. They they've been really great the first few times we've met and talked, and um, they did have some really good input on some of these things we've been doing. So they're, they're a great group. So. Thank thank you for uh, thank you for mentioning well, them as well. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks, Russ. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. You too. Uh, next item of business on the agenda is to sign a one-year contract extension with uh, Seal Coating, and we are joined by Town Engineer J.R. Fry. Good evening, J.R. Welcome. I think you're muted. There we go. Good evening. There we go. So, yeah, this is um, this is a contract to continue one component, or rather, a couple of components of our road maintenance and reconstruction. Uh, process that we do uh, during our annual uh, road improvements every year. Um, so this contract covers the road maintenance aspects, which include uh, primarily the crack sealing, and then it, it covers the microsurfacing treatment that we do subsequent to uh, normal asphalt paving. Okay. Um Chair, just a quick question. Um, when was the last time that we bid this contract out? Was this one of the ones we bid out last year or is this is this one that hasn't been bid out in a while? Uh, this one was bid out in 2019. Okay, So Thank I believe you. this is the last extension. Yep, I, I would just note for my colleagues and for the public that uh, we have wonderful partners such as Seal Coating, uh, but also to ensure that we are getting the best value for your tax dollars. Uh, every few years, the board does uh, issue requests for proposals for different, different, you know, professional and contract services and materials. Uh, we just think that it's a it's a good practice to have. Um, Joe, any questions for Jr. with respect to the contract extension? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, and thank you, Jr. for the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. How how have the uh, how has the existing contractor done so far? in terms of both the quality of the work and staying within budget? Uh, I'll say they are, first of all, very responsive to uh, all of our requests. And uh, they're, uh, they're, I don't like to call contractors partners because they have their own interests at heart, but they've worked very closely with us and, uh, and done very well for the town. The quality of the work is excellent. Uh, the microservicing treatment that they produce for us is a proprietary uh, component that is um, really gives a lot of durability to our roads uh, and has served the town well in its use. The um, and so and the the quality of their work is uh, very high. And in terms of staying within budget, uh, you know they. We kind of determine the budgets ahead of time. Um, we know the areas that we need to treat and uh, they do exactly what we ask and they hit the budget uh, at or under the budget every year. So this year in the contract extension, the budget is um, uh, six, a little over $637,000. Um, yes. How, how was that number arrived at? That number is actually the bid number that they originally bid at. Yep. Uh, we do a varying amount of work. Uh, the 637 is what is authorized. Uh, in a typical year, we probably do, I would say between two and 300,000 yep. with them. And uh, this year it's probably going to be a little bit more because we're, uh, there are a couple roads that got paved late in the season last year. And so we'll be playing catch up early this season. But with all that said, they will be well under that 637,000. Great. Uh, and one other question. So this contract extension expires at the end of this, calen uh, this calendar year. Yes. Uh, when do we need to get going uh, to follow up with Mary's uh, point about putting this out to bid for the next uh, next round for next year? Uh, we will be putting this out to bid uh, sometime in the November to January timeframe. 
That way the contract will be in place uh, well in advance of construction season. Great, thank you. I really appreciate your efforts here. Uh, Bill, any questions for JR? Uh, just with respect to um, with respect to process, JR. So when we when we contract with these companies, do we do it on a one year basis for an extension for two years? Is that what we normally do? Uh, the way that the contract is set up is a it's a one year uh, calendar year contract. So it covers whatever calendar year we sign up for, with the uh, option of two extensions. Uh, the option is actually, uh, it's predicated on both the towns and the contractor's agreement. So the contractor, if they determine that uh, the contract is not in their interest anymore, uh, they do have the option to uh, not proceed with it on the option year. Um, with all of that said, uh, yes, basically we approach them each year and uh, if both parties are uh, in agreement, we can extend it uh, each year going forward. We don't do it. We don't do two a two year extension. We do two one year extensions. Right. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone in the public who has a question uh, with respect to this contract extension? Seeing none, I'd accept a motion. I make a motion to sign a one-year contract extension with seal coating in, uh, incorporated DBA Indus for roadway management construction services, microservicing and random crack sealing by fiber reinforced method and an amount not to exceed $637,579.40. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Uh, JR, thank you so much. Thank Have you. Have a good all evening. Much. Good evening. Next item of business on the board's agenda is to approve a modification to the outdoor table service permit granted to the 99 restaurant of Boston LLC, doing business as the 99 restaurant and pub to modify the outdoor table service premises um, set up. This is with respect to the uh, 99 located on Route 3A. Michelle, uh, could you just give a quick overview of, of this request? Sure, thanks, Mary. So now that the weather is changing, we might get a few of these requests for modifications. This plan, as you mentioned, was approved by the board last year. And the 99, um, as part of their original plan, had blocked off six parking spaces so that they could separate those parking spaces from an area outside where they had tables. I can pull up the map in a minute. Um, because their takeout service is doing pretty well, they've requested that they would like to change the type of barriers and move them slightly so that they can actually now use those six parking spaces as um, for takeout. Let me just share this. I think the easiest, let's see. This is a picture from the area where over here is where they have about six different tables. And right now they've got these stanchions in place with chains, but they'd like to remove these barriers and use a more substantial type Jersey barrier over here between the parking spaces and the area where the tables are. Um, just go up a little bit. So these are the types of barriers that they're proposing using. The restaurant reopening group has reviewed this request and is okay with it. Um, this, I don't know how easy this plan is to read, but um, this is the area right here where all the tables are. And like I said, they're proposing moving the barrier from here to here. So Two Michelle, the other, there's yeah. no, change, no change in outdoor seating capacity. No change to any other piece of the plan. Um, the, the restaurant group has reviewed this um, to an, a question that came up before. There's really no abutters in this area. Let me share something else. Um, and there's been no complaints according to the police department. So this is the area we're talking about. And as you can see, the abutters are like stop and shop um, and some other businesses across the way, but there's been no other issues reported and there's no other changes proposed to this plan. Thank Mary, you. just so you know, Chief Jones is on the line if you have questions. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tom. Uh, Bill, maybe we'll start with you. Do you have any questions for Michelle or for Chief Jones on this? Uh, yeah, so a couple, couple uh, questions. So Michelle, the reason why this comes to us and not the planning board is because 
it's being done um, pursuant to the gubernatorial order, correct? Right, this is still under the emergency, the declaration of emergency and the, the process that we, the town put in place to have these uh, temporary outdoor seating services approved by this board. Okay, and the, um, you said the, the, the working group signed off on it, so I, I imagine Sergeant Kilroy um, yes. was the PD so, representative. Yes, he was, he reviewed the barriers and is okay with it. Okay, um, I, I, I think it's great, fully supportive of it. I'm not going to get into a larger discussion tonight, but I um, I did I have recently contacted Tom. A lot of restaurant owners love the fact they can sit outside uh, and have this opportunity, and um, I anticipate us getting requests to extend it when the state of emergency ends. Um, so I think this is wonderful, and it's great to see these restaurants taking taking an opportunity to do this and uh, keeping their customers safe. And we'll Thanks, work with, with real estate council to figure out what um, needs to happen for any requests like that, that, that may be, you know, longer than the state of emergency. Thank you. Uh, Joe, questions? Um, I, I think this, this makes a lot of sense. We, we really need to, to consider the, the constraints that the restaurants have been forced to operate under. Um, so I, I, I really um, support this. Um, I, I just want to make sure, and uh, if someone from the police department is on, that there's no safety issue that arises as a result of the proposed change. Uh, Chief Jones? Hi, Joe. Uh, yeah, there's no safety concerns. Sergeant Kilroy reviewed that, uh, and he had no issues with it at all. Um, and do you know if there have been any complaints uh, from either uh, patrons or anyone else in terms of the operation uh, of the 99 during this time? I did check that a little while ago and we have no uh, complaints um, on record here. Great. I mean, they're, they're, their slogan is they're the real deal and they, they really <laughs> have been um, living up to that. So uh, I, I do appreciate this and uh, I support the, uh, the proposed action here. Uh, I would just echo Bill Ramsey's comments. Um, the, as, as we all know, the lingering effects of COVID-19 are going to go beyond the lifting of the state of emergency whenever that is. And helping, helping maintain the vitality of our restaurants and doing what we can to help, um, especially restaurants in Hingham, many of which are owned and operated by you know, our friends and neighbors um, I think would be would be very much appreciated. And I think people are enjoying the opportunity to have outdoor dining, uh, not just here in Hingham, but in other places. Is there anyone uh, who has a question or wishes to make a comment before the board takes a vote on this action? Seeing none, I'd accept a motion. Sure, I'll move to approve modification of the outdoor table service OTS permit dated June 18, 2020, as extended October 20. 2020 issued to 99 restaurants of Boston LLC, DBA 99 restaurant and pub to replace the plan of the OTS premises with the plan submitted March 9, 2020. Any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor and no? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Thank you. Uh, next item of business is to sign an engagement letter with Tarlo Breed Hart and Rogers PC for legal services, Tom? Sure, thank you, Mary. So this comes. This is a request that comes to us from town council. Uh, they're asking that we consider hiring Tarlo Breed to be available to town council uh, to confer with on certain litigation matters. You may remember that uh, Tarlo Breed was available to council during, um, during the water company case and, uh, and it was in fact of great value. So. Um, they're recommending that we that we bring them on again, and uh, not as not, not with any retainer of any kind, just be it available um, to the extent we we need them. Um, and so, Tom, I I think I know the answer to this, but um, does does signing this engagement letter commit town 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 dollars in any way? No. Thank you, uh, Joe. Any questions for Tom? No, I'm I'm familiar with the proposal, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Bill, uh, no questions. Okay, uh, I'll make a motion to authorize the town administrator to sign the engagement letter with Tarlow Breed Hart and Rogers PC for legal services. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. 
Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye. Um, we have a, um, uh, I'm just looking here. Uh, before we go to Inside Town, oh, I'm sorry, that's the posted one at seven o'clock, 7.05. So uh, let's go to Inside Town Finances. Um. Am I am I good on the agenda? Yep. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk for a couple of minutes about Hingham's bond rating. This is something that's come up. Uh, it comes up in, in many different ways, but in particular during a lot of budget conversations, there's some been some discussion. Uh, Michelle, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, you know, just as a way to start out, um, Hingham issues bonds to finance capital projects. So we issued bonds to finance East School. Uh, to finance the middle school, uh, to finance the purchase of the two pieces of fire apparatus that was purchased a few years a few years ago, uh, we will be issuing debt to finance the remainder of the town share of the Plymouth River Window Project if approved at town meeting. And our goal is to obtain the lowest possible interest cost, uh, just like a home mortgage. The lower the interest rate, the lower the payment. And a bond rating is actually similar to an individual credit score. It measures credit worthiness. Um, just like a credit rating, the higher the rating, the better. Um, a high rating means that it is the rating agency's view that a municipality is not likely to default on payment. Municipalities with strong uh, bond ratings have greater access to capital markets and pay a lower interest cost. And we'll show how that's benefited the town. And um, bond ratings are issued every time a municipality issues debt. And it's important to note that while we think of sometimes, you know, issuing debt for things like a school project um, or fire trucks or, you know, something like that, um, a lot of Hingham's debt is actually short-term debt uh, because the interest rates are so low right now. So we are typically out issuing debt at least, you know, once a year. Um, we have one-year bond anticipation notes that mature on a yearly basis. So, for example, this May, we will be going out to refinance, um, you know, probably over $10 million worth of debt. So, um, each time we go out to issue debt, there is a credit rating, uh, there is a bond rating that is given. Uh, next slide, Michelle. So, there are three, uh, three, credit, three main credit reporting agencies, uh, Moody's Investor Services, Standard and Poor's and Fitch ratings. And while each of the rating agencies have, um, you know, slightly different scales, in general, uh, the rating agencies uh, break, out, break out ratings into um, what they call investment grade bonds and then high yield bonds or, you know, sometimes called junk bonds. Um, across the board for the investment grade bonds, those are bonds that typically have a rating of the letters A and the letters B. And there are different, you know, there's, there's triple A, there's double A, there's AAB, there's BAA. Um, there are a lot of different kind of variations, but in general, it's just kind of like school. An A is better than a B, a B is better than a C, a C is better than a D. Uh, Michelle, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so how are these ratings determined? Each rating agency looks at both qualitative and quantitative factors. Uh, they look at demographics, they look at the tax base, they look at the financial health of the community, they look at its debt profile and they look at its management. And actually uh, Moody's has what they call a scorecard. And that scorecard is based off of a, a government scorecard. And so they basically assign 30% of their rating is the economy and the tax base, 30% are finances. And the big thing for Moody's with finances is fund balance. 20% uh, is management, that's us, and 20% is debt and pension management. And so, for example, in last summer, when we issued debt for the uh, purchase of the water company, Moody's developed a scorecard based on all these different factors. Uh, they looked at quantitative factors, qualitative factors, and they assigned ratings. Uh, Michelle, if you want to go to the next slide. So what is our rating? Well, Hingham is a, a triple A with all three rating agencies, um, capitalization aside. And it was actually in uh, the spring of 2002 when the town actually earned the AAA designation from all three communities. 
Um, several years ago, Hingham was only one of a handful of municipalities in Massachusetts with the AAA rating. Um, I actually reached out to Capital Markets to ask them kind of where that stands right now. And while they haven't gotten back to me, I would note that um, in early March of this year, Cambridge, uh, the city of Cambridge also uh, received, was uh, their AAA bond rating from all three rating agencies was affirmed. And in their press release, they said that they were one of 27 cities in the entire US with the triple AAA from all, all three rating agencies. So uh, I'm not sure if they, if they just look at cities or they, that includes municipalities, but, but this, this puts us in a pretty elite category. And um, uh, Michelle, if you wanna kind of uh, go to the next slide, I just wanna, re th these are a couple excerpts from uh, the AAA was last affirmed, as I said, last July. And Moody said, you know, the reason that they say it is the town continues to demonstrate strong and conservative fiscal management, including formal financial policies, multi-year budget forecasts, and a five-year capital plan. Additionally, the town continues to aggressively fund its long-term liabilities. Uh, Standard & Poor's said, while we do not anticipate lowering our rating on the town, we could do so if operating performance weakens, leading the reserves to fall below 15% of expenditures, or if the town fails to adhere to current management practices and financial policies. During the budget season, you heard us talking a lot about our financial policy. We were talking about fund balance and making sure we weren't using too much one-time money. The reason that we were doing that in large part was, was based on what we were hearing from the rating agencies. Um, in the next year, it's likely that the town will be going out to issue debt that could approach $100 million. So having access to those low interest rates is really pretty important. Um, and then Fitch essentially said that our general fund expenditure growth has been in line with revenue growth and the town has flexibility to reduce expenditures if necessary. Um, Michelle, if you could go to the next slide. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the value of the AAA bond rating. And, you know, I think there are, the value is, it comes in many different ways, but just some clear cut examples. In 2000, our AAA rating saved taxpayers $400,000 over the life of a bond issuance for renovations to South and, and uh, Hingham High School. In 2008, we needed a construction loan to build East School and the credit markets were frozen. The only people, the only municipalities could, who could get credit was the AAA, were the AAA communities. It didn't matter about price. If we didn't have our AAA, we would have had to wait to have built East School. In 2009, we saved close to a million dollars over the life of a $43 million bond issuance. And over the last 10 years, um, according to capital markets, we have saved over $6 million versus a AA rating which is an average differential of about 11% in cost. And, and kind of not to get too geeky here on the, on, on the finances, but in particular over the last five years with interest rates being so low, the spread between the AAA and the AA is pretty narrow right now. You know, it's, it's maybe like half a percent, a quarter of a percent. And you could, you could look at that and say, well, that's really not a big deal. Um, in, in a market where interest rates are, are a little bit higher, um, you'll see those spreads, uh, you, you'll see those spreads actually, uh, the, the spreads are a little bit wider. And again, um, as we're looking to make, as we are looking to make some significant capital investments in this town over the next few years, um, we're gonna need to go to the taxpayers and say, hey, this is how much we may be asking to raise your taxes to build these projects. I will tell you, especially what we saw with the water company was that lower interest rate really made a difference in the cost to the taxpayer. So I, I know there's been some talk about, you know, if, you know, we could do more with our operating budgets if our, if our credit rating was lower. If our credit rating was lower, our debt service expenses would be a heck of a lot higher. And it would just make it that much more difficult to balance some of our budgets. Uh, so that's a little bit of an overview of, uh, of, of, uh, of the bond rating. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Harbor Media is going to record uh, this episode. We'll have a one-pager up on the town website tomorrow. Um, 
Bill or Joe, I don't know if you have any questions about the bond rating. I don't, that was very thorough. No questions and it, it's great to know that we're, we are one of possibly 27 towns or cities in the country that has this. Yeah, um, and I would also just remind people, I think um, Jim Taylor, the former chair of the advisory committee who also, uh, you know, is uh, works in capital markets. Um, you know, he, he made a comment a few weeks ago in one of our meetings, really hard to, really hard to, you know, it's, it's challenging to get that AAA. Once you lose it, it's even harder to get it back. Um, so uh, any questions from the public on Inside Town Finances? Okay, uh, seeing none, Tom, COVID-19 update? Great. Thank you, Mary. So the COVID-19 update for today, um, as of yesterday, confirmed COVID-19 cases in Massachusetts totaled 594,242. There have been 81 new cases of COVID-19 in Hingham over the past 14 days, and a total of 1,738 cases in Hingham since the start of the pandemic. According to public health data from the MassDPH released last week, the town's designation remains yellow again, indicating a medium risk of spread in the community. The average daily incidence rate for the town of Hingham was 24.1 per 100,000 residents, and our percent positivity rate was 2.54% for the previous 14 days. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky expressed serious concern yesterday about the number of new COVID-19 cases hospitalizations, and deaths rising across the country. She cautioned that these conti continuing concerning trends reflect a trajectory similar to some European countries that have experienced a consistent and worrying spike in cases, end quote. She advised Americans to re recommit to public health prevention strategies and to hold on a little while longer and to get vaccinated when you can. Regarding a vaccine rollout, according to the DPH's daily COVID-19 vaccine report, over 1.27 million people in Massachusetts have been fully vaccinated as of yesterday. We are, uh, as we mentioned last week, the, as we mentioned last week, the DPH has started to report vaccination rates by community on a weekly basis. So as of March 25th, approximately 19.2% of Hingham residents have been fully vaccinated. As, as of March 22nd, residents aged 60 and over and certain workers, uh, including workers in restaurants, grocery stores, retail, transportation, public works, and utilities, uh, became eligible for the vaccine. As of next Monday, April 5th, residents ages 55 and over and residents of one certain medical condition become eligible. Two weeks later, on, April, on Monday, April 19th, the general public, ages 16 and over, become eligible for the vaccine in Massachusetts. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Joe, any questions for Tom with respect to the COVID-19 update? Yes, uh, Tom, how are we doing on COVID testing in town and the uh, empathy site? Yeah, we're doing well. Um, we're still pretty busy. We, If you remember a couple of weeks ago, I think we knocked uh, the total number of days that, at that testing site down from six to four. Um, but uh, we're still seeing the need. The public is still using the facility. I know that there are other uh, venues available to the public as well now. So, um, so that's good. Testing is good. It's a great public health strategy um, as a component to our entire to our global um, uh, strategy for fighting the pandemic. But um, for now, yes, we're still using it. <laughs> great. Uh, well, in a pandemic, yeah. it's great. Um, yeah. And how are we uh, in terms of... Uh, vaccine availability for our teachers? So the teachers are eligible. Um, we have, I, I, was, I was asking the percentage of teachers that have been vaccinated uh, earlier today uh, and, we were, and we were looking for that number. I don't have it for you right now, but uh, teachers are, vac uh, are eligible to be vaccinated and many of ours in Hingham have indeed received the first vaccination. Great, uh, Thank thanks, no other questions. Uh, Bill, any questions for Tom on the COVID-19 update? No questions. Uh, questions from the public on the COVID-19 update. Okay, um, seeing none, uh, we have, uh, it is, uh, I note that it is seven o'clock. We have a um, public, a posted public hearing on the transfer 
of a uh, of a liquor license uh, that's going to begin at 705. Uh, I might just recommend, because I know we're going to have, uh, we've got a long evening ahead of us. I'm just going to recommend that the board take a five minute recess that we reconvene at 7.05. Uh, I note that Ms. Farnsworth uh, representing Legal Seafood has joined the meeting. So uh, we, will, uh, we will resume in five minutes. We will uh, take up that hearing and then we will uh, proceed with our police sergeant interviews. Great. Nothing like a good five minute dinner.
We'll just wait a moment for our other colleague to return. Okay, uh, back, back from recess. The next item of business on the agenda is a public hearing of the transfer of the restaurant common victualler all alcoholic beverages license and pledge of license from Legal Seafoods LLC doing business as Legal Sea Bar to LSF Hingham LLC doing business as Legal Sea Bar. Uh, we're joined by uh, Ms. Patricia Farnsworth. Um, Michelle or Tom, uh, could one of you perhaps just give, give the board and the public an overview of this request? I'd be happy to, Mary. So basically this request from Legal Seafoods is a request for a transfer of license and a pledge of license. And it's being triggered by a new entity coming in and purchasing all of the Legal Seafoods in one big transaction. So it's being done as a reverse filing with the ABCC. Sharon's been in touch with them to make sure that all the paperwork is in order. It is, um, I understand that there's no change of manager in this case and Mr. Hayward I see is on the call with us now. Um, and that an attorney Farnsworth, like you mentioned, is also here to represent them. Uh, terrific, uh, thank you. And Mr. Hayward, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, Joe, do you have any questions for Michelle, Ms. Farnsworth or Mr. Hayward? No, I've reviewed the application. It looks complete. And um, as long as they keep serving uh, to our residents, I think this is a great move. Uh, Bill, any questions? No additional questions, thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Farnsworth or Mr. Hayward, anything to add? No, not at this moment, thank you. Okay, uh, is there anyone in the public who has a question or wishes to make a comment? Uh, if not, I'd accept a motion. I make a motion to approve the request of LSF Hingham LLC DBA Legal C Bar for a pledge of license to Northern Bank and Trust Company subject to the approval of the Massachusetts Alcohol Beverages Control Commission. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary, aye. And then I'll make the other motion, which is the transfer of the license. I'll make a motion to approve the transfer of the restaurant common victualler all alcoholic beverages license from Legal Seafoods LLC doing business as Legal Sea Bar to LSF Hingham LLC doing business as Legal C Bar, Mark J. Hayward Manager, subject to the approval of the Massachusetts Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary, aye. Uh, terrific. Uh, Ms. Farnsworth, Mr. Hayward, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, Mr. Hayward, continued success. Uh, we know it's been a tough year and uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, better things to come. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, the next item of business on the board's agenda, as we said at the start of the meeting, is uh, our police sergeant interviews. Um, we currently have, uh, have two openings for police sergeant positions in the Hingham Police Department. And the, the town and the board is very fortunate that we have uh, six six uh, officers who have been uh, put themselves forward for consideration for these positions. Uh, for those of you who have watched in the past, uh, what you will see is we will be, uh, th these interviews will be done in the public. Uh, while you as the public are welcome to watch these interviews, uh, we will not be taking questions or comments from the public. Um, uh, Chief Jones is going to be introducing each candidate and our, our protocol as we go through and we meet all of these six candidates uh, are that the candidate uh, will, will begin by introducing him or herself with a little bit of background. Uh, members of the board will take turns asking questions of the candidate. At the conclusion of the interview, the candidate will have a chance for any sort of closing remarks. And uh, we will follow that process as we, as we meet and learn about um, each of these six fine candidates. Uh, so with that, uh, Chief Jones, welcome. And uh, I'd, I'd invite you to introduce the first candidate for the, to, to meet with us this evening. Good evening, Mary. Thank you very much. The first candidate I'm going to bring in is uh, Officer Jim Brady. Good evening, Officer Brady. Welcome. Good evening. Can you hear us okay? 
I can, yes. It's, uh, thank you for being with us this, this evening. Um, uh, as I believe Chief Jones has probably uh, mentioned to you, uh, we'd invite you to make, uh, make some uh, opening remarks, introduce yourself to the board as well as to the public. Uh, my colleagues and I will take turns asking some questions. And then at the end, we'll give you a chance for any questions you have of us or any, any sort of closing comments. Sounds great. Uh, so, so with that, the floor is, the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, I'm Jimmy Brady, uh, born and raised in Hingham, Mass. Um, after graduating Hingham High, I went on to Bridgewater State University, where I obtained my bachelor's degree in criminal justice there. After graduating from Bridgewater State in 2010, I went on to work in the communications department at the Norfolk Police Department. After Norfolk, I went on to uh, nuclear security at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. There, I was able to obtain a uh, top secret security clearance level, worked at the nuclear facility. So that was kind of my first taste of a real role of responsibility in this field. And I feel like uh, really began to pave the way to set me up for success. Mm -hmm. In 2014, I was fortunate enough to uh, have the opportunity to go through the uh, interview process for the Hingham Police Department. I was selected. And uh, at the end of 2014, I graduated from the Plymouth Police Academy uh, and became a member of the police department where I've been since. Since I've been at the police department, uh, a few of the things that I've been able to achieve thus far Early on in my career, I was given the opportunity to become a field training officer. Since then, I've become a firearms instructor, a less lethal instructor, a taser instructor, a use of force instructor. Uh, I'm also a member of the uh, Metrolex SWAT team and the current director of the Citizens Police Academy up at Lincoln Ponds. Uh, within the first two years here at Hingham PD, um, I also went on to get my master's degree in criminal justice at Curry College, so I now have that as well. And um, since then, the present day, uh, I'm married. We're actually expecting uh, our first baby this summer. It's going to be a baby girl. So I would say between these interviews tonight and picking names, my best challenges are ahead of me. But, <laughs> but, I, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate uh, you participating in this to uh, help select the best candidates for this role. I look forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we're going to have uh, Bill Ramsey lead off with a question, followed by Selectman Fisher, followed by uh, followed by me. Sure. Bill? All right. Um, Officer Brady, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your service to our town and in particular your service on the Metro SWAT team, which I, I believe that you were involved uh, with last Friday's incident. So uh, thank you for, for all you do. Um, my question to you. Uh, Officer Brady is as a sergeant, uh, you will be the first line supervisor of officers on the road who at times will make mistakes. How will you differentiate between a teachable moment or a training opportunity and the need to take discipline while ensuring maximum transparency and department operations? Well, first and foremost, I think uh, it, it is important to differentiate between a teaching moment and a training opportunity. Um, Having already been a field training officer for a few years, uh, I've had many opportunities to be in these positions that have, I think, helped set me up for being here today. But um, I think the major difference is teachable moments. Um, there, there are things that we can quickly discuss and we can move on and that um, may have just been a, a break in judgment or, or a break in our decision making. But um, as far as training opportunities, I think what we have to understand is as first line supervisors and ultimately leaders in this police department, as a sergeant, uh, as long as we understand that our people are in charge of the day-to-day -day tasks and the day-to-day -day functions within this field. Um, and that we have become responsible for the people who are responsible for those tasks. Uh, I think we, we just continue to arm ourselves with the tools we need to, uh, to, educate, to educate our officers and uh, bestow upon them the confidence they need to go out there and effectively do their jobs. Thank you. Uh, Joe? Uh, yes. Um... Officer Brady, good, good to meet you. Um, following up with Bill's question, but a little different slant, how would you handle a dispute among police officers if you become a sergeant and then you're, you're in a supervisory responsibility? How would you handle that dispute? Uh, I, I think, I think as, as a sergeant, we need, to, we need to bring everyone to the round table collectively and we need to discuss first, we need to identify the root, uh, the root of what caused the dispute. Once we identify the root of what caused the dispute, I think from there, uh, we can begin to work on a resolution. So I would talk with each officer individually. Uh, I would get kind of their side of the story. 
I would use group collective knowledge, anyone that may have been involved in the matter. Um, again, uh, get their side of the story as well. Uh, if documentation was necessary, which in those situations it would be necessary, I would have I would have everything documented and then collectively myself with with our uh, superior superior officers in chain of command, um, we would have to decide if, if this warrants discipline. Certainly it, it would warrant um, at least documentation at the very least. I know we have early warning intervention systems here at the Hingham Police Department known as guardian tracking. That's ultimately a system in which uh, this data is collected, whether it's positive data or negative data. And we would go back and see if there's a prior track record with these officers, uh, if there's a history of this and then further corrective action may be necessary. But at the very least, it would be documented. Um, we would use the collective knowledge of everyone who was on scene and we would obviously utilize the chain of command to uh, come to a decision of how to resolve the matter. Great, thank you. Um, officer, thank you for being here tonight. Um, if you're promoted to the position of Sergeant, you're gonna be directly supervising officers who were formerly your peers. What steps will you take to establish your authority and credibility while maintaining a positive working relationship with the officers? I, I think I've already taken a lot of steps to establish that credibility with my peers. Again, early on becoming a field training officer, I've, I've had the opportunity to train, to train a lot of my peers um, and really establish to them that uh, I, I can be there for them if, if they need to make a phone call, if they need to approach me about a question. Um, in addition, I'm heavily involved in the training with the department, whether it be firearms, taser training, use of force training. So I feel as though my peers do understand that they can come to me. They know I'm knowledgeable. They know that my phone is always on. Uh, between field training, between training in general in the department, uh, between the Metrolex SWAT team, as well as being a former DRE, uh, my phone, I've been on call pretty much 24 seven for my entire career. And I, and I think my peers do understand that. Uh, in addition, I think what we do need to understand is we need to understand the fundamental differences in becoming a leader in the police department and uh, supervising. So in my, in, in my opinion, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, I think we need to understand that in my current role and, and in my peers' roles, we're responsible for the day-to-day -day tasks and job functions uh, that the department and the organization requires, but becoming a leader, we're no longer necessarily directly involved in those. Uh, rather, we're responsible for the people who are responsible for those roles. So with that being said, uh, I don't subscribe to the school of thought that leaders are born. I think leaders are cultivated and they're made. And I think everyone has the choice to become one. Um, it's just, it just becomes a personal choice at, at, that, uh, at that juncture. I also believe that, uh, again, just lending credibility to my peers, that I understand that this role comes with great personal sacrifice. And what I mean by that is... When things are going great and things are going well, it's those that we're leading and those that we're responsible for that deserve all the credit. And I think, again, that will lend to that credibility. And I think a lot of my peers already do understand that about me. But um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, when things are going poorly uh, in this role, that personal sacrifice is oftentimes on taking that and just building the trust in my peers that they know that when things are going poorly, I'll work with them to develop a resolution and I will get through it. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Thank you. Um, Officer Brady, um, you've been a police officer in the department for several years now, and uh, looking at your resume, I noted that you have, have a wide range of experience. If appointed a sergeant, what, if any, changes will you make to the shift that you supervise to improve operations and increase morale? So I think morale is a, a, a very key topic we need to discuss right now. Uh, in modern day policing. So changes I'd make is uh, I would absolutely advocate, advocate for my shift and advocate for my officers. One of the things that I think we really need to uh, stay in touch with here at the police department is creating opportunity. We have right now a large majority of our department and it's slowly becoming the majority of the department are younger officers, average age of 25 or 26 years old, um, less than 10 years experience on. I know I was fortunate enough to have a lot of opportunity when I first came to the police department. And what that did in turn was it, it, it kept me motivated and inspired to seek further training, to seek higher education. So I think one of the things I would do is absolutely advocate for more opportunity for my officers uh, so that we can give the community the best possible product we can with motivated officers who are inspired and in, uh, seeking higher education to achieve those positions of opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Joe? Yes, uh, Officer Brady. Being a police sergeant, is you know can be complex and require a fair amount of patience. 
Can you give us one example where you did not lose your cool in spite of some very trying circumstances? Sure. Uh, not too long ago, a few few weeks ago, we we received a call from a woman who was concerned about the father of her child, uh, stating that he had become more and more disillusioned, more and more irrational. Um, he had made statements of self harm. He had made statements of possibly suicide by police officer if uh, if she had called police and we had intervened. Um, at this point, we had to intervene, so we went to the house. Uh, as we were approaching the house, I could tell from the beginning at least from an operational standpoint, that it was going to be a difficult situation to deal with just based on the location of the house and the element of surprise, which, which would be in our favor. So I kind of asked those with, with me if they wouldn't mind if I assumed operational commanded this and kind of took the lead on this. So with that being said, uh, we approached the house. At this time, the individual's brother came out of the house. We had already identified the individual, so we knew it wasn't him, and, and we knew it was his brother. His brother came out of the house, urged us to leave, um, said nothing good could come to this if, if we were here. Uh, clearly had some trust issues with the police that we had to understand. And uh, just being very difficult, not allowing us to, to get past that and, uh, and deal with the problem at hand. While we were trying to mitigate and, uh, and de-escalate with the individual's brother, the individual actually came out of the house. Um, basically expressing the same sentiment he had about negative feelings towards the police. Nothing good can come from us being here. Uh, I asked him for the opportunity just to have a brief conversation with him. Uh, at the end of that conversation, we were actually able to gain uh, voluntary compliance for him to go to the hospital to seek further treatment. And uh, to bring it full circle, a few weeks later, we actually um, wound up doing a birthday drive-by for him, um, his baby's mother, and, and his child uh, at the house. So I think that really helped build a little rapport with him, him and his family, and uh, kind of turn things around there. But very volatile situation, uh, difficult to work through at first, but we just, we just had to stay on the operational course that we had committed to and uh, ultimately achieved a peaceful resolution. Thank you. Um, Officer Brady, I wondered if you could describe um, things that you've done over the last year to build your skills and knowledge as it relates to um, policing. Sure, um, specific things I've done over the last year, obviously be, being an FTO, I, I have the opportunity oftentimes months at a time, up to a third of the year every year uh, to be training new officers. So what this does is uh, it puts the onus on me. I, I have to keep my skills sharp and I have to maintain a certain level of proficiency within the job to pass on when I mentor these younger officers. Also, I have the opportunity every single week with uh, the Metro Lex SWAT team. We're required to train every single week. And during that training, every member of the team from the junior member on the team to the most senior members on the team they're thrusted into these positions of leadership and decision-making. And at the end of that, we're critiqued. We're asked, we're asked what we did wrong. We're told what we did wrong. And um, we're, we're also just expected to be in these positions of leadership constantly and uh, almost trial by fire, just thrusted into them. So I just feel like over the past year or so, I've just, I've just had a lot of exposure to leadership opportunities, mentor, mentor opportunities and coaching opportunities that have really put me in a position to be, position to be comfortable in making this transition. Thank you. Um, and I think we've got time for one more question from each member of the board. Bill? Um, yeah, Officer Brady, um, as you know, the legislature just passed a police reform bill. Um, you talked a lot about training. How will you train new officers uh, to meet the challenges of, of the new environment of modern day policing? So with reform, I think first what we have to really convey to our officers that this is not the end of the world. Uh, what it is, is an evolution in law enforcement. And it's, a net, it's an inevitable evolution that we should embrace because it's an opportunity to, uh, to build and mend new relationships with the communities we serve. With that being said, uh, I'm a member of the Use of Force Training Committee with the department. So I understand that it's my job um, to arm these officers with the knowledge they need, as well as the training they need to go out there to be able to confidently do their jobs and know that we support them when they are doing their jobs. And I feel as long as we arm our officers with this knowledge, and we supply them with the, uh, the training to support that knowledge, and they're able to effectively do their jobs, we're gonna see a direct correlation to the community um, and the output and the product that we provide to those communities. So as long as we're providing, as long as we're absorbing that information and then giving it out to our officers and, and really providing it to them and, and making sure they have the confidence to go out there with that information, then I think we're gonna be okay. Uh, Joe, another question? Yes. Um... Following up on, on what you've heard before about, you know, there's new police laws out there. Um, 
how do you stay updated on new laws, regulations, police methods, procedures, and techniques? How do you stay current with all that? So I, I stay current, current again, um, with, my, with my training at the police department for firearms, use of force, uh, all these different areas, we're required to attend yearly biannually trainings um, that help us stay up to date on it. Also in, uh, in my other opportunity, in my other job positions I have with the police department, whether it be uh, in, in the Metro law enforcement community, we're always bringing in subject matter experts who are educating us and giving us the most up-to-date information. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, Officer Brady, I think I've got the final question. Um, what distinguishes you from the other candidates under consideration for this role? I think early on in my career, I've just been um, very forward in achieving what I want. And I knew from the beginning of my career that this was something that one day I wanted to be in a position to achieve, to aspire to a role of leadership in the, within the organization. And I think since then, um, I've taken every opportunity and every bit of responsibility I can, not only to demonstrate that, but to prepare myself for that. Thank you. Um, at this point, I think the board would offer you the opportunity, if you have any questions for us, anything, any additional information that you would um, like the board or the public to know, uh, we'll, we'll give the floor back to you. Sure. Uh, the, the final thing I'd like to say is I just think as a police department, um, what I think we need to stay focused on is we just really need to stay focused on being goal oriented um, as opposed to vision oriented. And what I mean by that is visions, they're images of the finish line in, in images of the ultimate goal. But what a goal is to me is a goal is a measurable metric. And it's a measurable metric that we can look, that we can look forward to and that we can actually achieve along the way. And I think as long as we're achieving goals with the ultimate vision in mind and we have those metrics set in place, I think we're gonna create a work environment where our people really enjoy coming to work. They like what they do, they get along with their peers. And I think that type of positive work environment will directly uh, translate within to the community and the product we give to the community and their police department. Terrific. Um, Officer Brady, thank you so much. Thank you for your service to Hingham. Uh, thank you for putting yourself forward for consideration. Uh, we wish you the best of luck with your, um, with, with your upcoming, uh, with, with a child on the way. Um, good, good luck with that name thing. It gets kind of tricky <laughs> sometimes, but um, it's, it's a very exciting time for you and we wish you and your family all the best. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Chief Jones, I know there's usually a, a, a moment to, uh, 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 before setting up for the next candidate, if um, you could let the board know who will next be seeing. Sure, next is uh, Officer Brian Fernandez. Good evening, Officer Fernandez, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Um, this evening, uh, we're gonna start out, we're gonna ask you to take a few minutes and introduce yourself to the board and to the community. Uh, my colleagues and I will take turns asking some questions uh, and then prior to concluding, we'll turn it back over to you for any questions you have of us or any, any final remarks. Uh, so with that, uh, I welcome you here this evening and I invite you to introduce yourself to the board of the community. Well, thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Brian Fernandes. Um, I've been a uh, police officer full-time now for about, um, I'm in my 10th year. Um, I come from a law enforcement family, um, grand, grandson of a uh, police chief who started his career just next door in Cohasset. Um, and it's just kind of always what I wanted to do. So I just you know, headed my, uh, my life in that direction when I was younger. Um, so I attended Westfield State College, graduated with a degree in criminal justice. Um, after that, um, I began my career as a uh, part-time summer officer in the town of Hull. Um, worked there for about three and a half years. And then I was hired by the Sandwich Police Department, which is where I grew up in Sandwich, Mass. Um, I was on Sandwich for approximately six years. Um, during my time there, um, I, I attended uh, Curry College to obtain my master's degree. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked by the department to um, hold several positions, um, sexual assault investigator, field training officer, um, firearms instructor, um, honor guard member. I served on a few committees. Um, 
And I just really had a, uh, you know, wonderful time working there. Um, had a great relationship with everyone. Um, then it came a time where I kind of was looking to move up towards my family, which is from, from the area, from Cohasset, from Situate. Um, and, you know, it was kind of a now or never situation, but um, luckily enough, um, a couple of coworkers from when I worked in the town of Hull had come over to Hingham and they reached out to me. And uh, now Lieutenant John Marquardt, who I had met in Curry through the, uh, the uh, master's program, reached out and they said, hey, we're looking for somebody in Hingham. Do you want to come? And I jumped at the opportunity and, um, you know, haven't looked back um, since I've been here in Hingham. Um, I've been here for about three and a half years. Um, I've been fortunate enough again here to, to start to obtain, you know, a few positions as well. Um, field training officer. Um, I just took over the um, firearms licensing um, department um, with Officer Marcella about a year ago. Um, and, you know, things are, uh, things are going really well here and I'm uh, really happy with the move. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Joe Fisher to lead off. Yes, uh, Officer Fernandez, thank you for being here and, and thank you for your service, not only to Hingham, but for the various communities where you served. Thank you. Um, let, let me let me ask um, in recognition of if you become a sergeant, you will have supervisory responsibilities. How would you handle a dispute among police officers? Um, I would handle it um, one on one, first of all. Um, I would talk to each of the, you know, the officers involved um, on a one on one basis, um, try to get to the root of the problem, listen to them, see what they have to say. Um, you know, it can be kind of not commonplace, but it does happen. Um, you know, between officers on shift for one reason or another. Um, but I think it's important to listen to each officer, kind of come to an understanding, um, you know, and then sit, the, sit them down together and say, hey guys, you know, I, I, even, if, even if we can't come to an agreement on this, at the end of the day, you know, we have to work together, we have a goal to achieve and, you know, you're gonna have to put it aside. Um, but hopefully, you know, usually those, those things kind of go a little bit better and um, you're able to come to a resolution pretty, uh, pretty well. Great, thank you. Uh, Officer Fernandez, welcome. I I, uh, I had the pleasure of appointing you to the police department a few years ago, and um, uh, it, it is nice to see you back here this evening. And before asking my question, I also just want to um, comment on the professionalism of the materials that you provided the board uh, with respect to your application. And uh, they were very impressive and very helpful in, um, in outlining your background and your experience. Um, officer, if you're promoted to the position of sergeant, you're going to be directly supervising officers who were formerly your peers. Uh, what steps will you take to establish your authority and credibility while still maintaining a positive working relationship with the officers? Well, I think um, in this area, the, the fact that I transferred actually kind of helps me out in this, in this um, you know, realm. Um, I have formed a great relationship with the people here in Hingham since I've come over. Um, but I've also kind of, I, I don't have those, you know, long-term, um, you know, maybe biases towards certain people. Um, I've tried to come in here and just, you know, learn quietly in the beginning and then start getting along with everyone. So I, I think that I've developed kind of a, a very good professional relationship with all of my coworkers, but I've also kind of kept that personal relationship aside for the most part. Um, so I think that does aid in being able to, you know, separate the, the friendships and the, you know, boss kind of, um, you know, mentality. Um, I, I think that because of that, um, it, it just kind of enables me to, to remove myself a little bit more than, than some others may. Um, and I, I think it will greatly assist me in, in being able to, you know, be the boss when I have to be, um, but, but still keep that, you know, um, relationship, that working relationship with the guys that I've tried to maintain all along, the guys and girls. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Thank you, Officer Fernandez. Um, uh, a good evening to you. I want to um, uh, thank you for your service to our community and, and compliment the work that you've done in the detectives unit. Um, as a sergeant, you will be the first line supervisor of officers who at times will make mistakes. How will you differentiate between a teachable moment and the need to take discipline while ensuring maximum transparency in department operations? Well, I think a teachable moment can happen with a, you know, everyone makes mistakes. Uh, nobody's perfect. Um, there's always teachable moments, you know, every day when we go to work, um, whether it's something extremely small, something a little bit bigger, 
Um, but there is kind of that clear line between something that can just be a teachable moment where I, you know, pull somebody aside and say, Hey, you know, let's not do it that way next time. Or, um, you know, something a little more of, of the lower level. Um, I think that when you cross that line and you're into, you know, uh, more serious offenses, um, whether it's a, you know, a, a violation of a policy or, or, you know, an integrity type issue or, you know, something of those lines, which, you know, the things you hope you never see, but, you know, realistically, you know, who knows. Um, but it's, it's just, there is that clear line where it's, you know, a, a small thing, maybe a teachable moment. And then once you cross that line into a, a more serious issue, um, it's absolutely something that, that has to be a, a formal discussion. And depending on what it is, um, you know, might need to be taken up the uh, chain of command. Uh, Joe? Yes, um, Officer Fernandez. Being a police sergeant officer is quite complex and requires a fair amount of patience. Can you give us one example where you did not lose your cool in spite of trying circumstances? Um, sure. So uh, an example of, of that would be um, kind of recently we had a uh, we had a call at the um, one of the apartment buildings in the uh, the Hingham shipyard for a uh, a suicidal male that had a firearm on him reported by his um, his family. Um, and, you know, I was able to work with my other, other officers on shift, um, myself and officer, uh, Jeremiah Sullivan, who you guys will interview later on. Um, you know, we, we developed a great teamwork in that scenario. We kept our cool, um, you know, in a situation that could have been highly volatile, um, with a, with a, with an armed, um, subject. And, you know, we were able to kind of develop a dialogue with him, um, get him to come out peacefully and, and, um, got him the help that he needed. Um, I think that could have been a really tense situation that, um, you know, turned out very well in the end. And I think that was because um, not just me, but all the officers that were there were, you know, um, very good at, at keeping their cool under the, uh, under the pressure of that situation. Thank you. Uh, officer, could you talk about uh, what you've done over the past year to build your skills and knowledge relative to law enforcement? So over the past year, I've actually, um, um, sucked, I, I, seeked out um, a couple of uh, trainings and um, when it comes to police supervision and police leadership. Um, that's, you know, I've, I've always kind of worked my whole career towards, you know, moving up with a department because I kind of, I, I see that as being able to, to affect change from within for the better and to, to uh, make a better department and a better community um, and serve the community better, uh, I should say. Um, so because of that, I, I actually have attended um, a couple of um, both online and, and in person, once we could go back in person, um, trainings on my own time um, with my own money. And, you know, they were, uh, again, police leadership, supervisory courses, um, just to kind of, you know, make myself stand out a little bit more, but also get that knowledge of, of how to become a better supervisor if I, you know, am chosen. Um, and I think, you know, aside from that, aside from the actual police role, um, you know, law enforcement role, um, there's also the community policing aspect. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do really well here is community policing. Um, but I always think we can kind of expand upon it. And um, a year ago, it's unfortunate, again, it was canceled. Um, but I, I had reached out to a contact that I had from my previous department with um, a company that puts on professional uh, sporting events with uh, professional teams. Um, so I actually had, you know, coordinated with our union presidents and we signed a contract for June of last year to uh, have a Patriot softball game for the, uh, for the community to invite everyone in and kind of something to bolster our relationship with everyone. And, and so people could see us out of a work capacity. Um, but unfortunately that kind of wasn't able to happen. So we're hoping to do it next year. But um, I, I think those are things both within, um, you know, the, the framework of the job itself. And then the, also the community policing aspect that I've kind of tried to work on in the past year. Thank you. Uh, Bill. Officer Fernandez, um, you've been a police officer for several years and looking at your resume, you have a wide range of experience. If appointed a sergeant, what if any changes will you make to the shift you supervise to improve operations and increase morale? Well, I think each shift kind of has its own character. Um, so it kind of depends on the shift you're supervising. But, you know, if you're if you're on a shift with a, you know, a somewhat more senior guy, uh, senior guys and girls, um, you know, it, you have to kind of approach it differently than if it's a shift with, you know, majority of newer, newer officers. Um, you know, it, the newer officers seem to respond well to, to um, you know, positive reinforcement. And, um, you know, when you kind of create group activities, whether it's a group community policing 
um, say, hey, you know, we're going to go down to uh, Red Eye Roasters or, you know, wherever for coffee this morning is a shift. Um, you know, it kind of boosts morale a little bit. Um, you know, when you're dealing with the more senior guys, it's, it's I think the, the, the respect that you give them um, kind of goes a long way. Um, we have a lot of great officers here in Hingham. Um, you know, the newer officers are, are continually learning and, you know, they, they're eager. Um, you know, the, the, the more senior officers are, are a little more seasoned, but they're, they're very good at their jobs. Um, so I think recognizing when they do a good job um, and, you know, praising them for it um, goes a long way with both, you know, junior and senior officers. But I do think you kind of have to tailor, you know, depending on how your shift is, you know, um, set up um, kind of how you approach that. that. Um, but, but again, I do think um, respect and uh, positive reinforcement will go a long way with both. Joe? Yes. So actually, Mary, my first question is to you, because I'm noticing that the question that I've asked third is has significantly overlapped the question you asked. So I'm going to ask a different third question, unless you think that's not appropriate. No, go for it. Um, so Officer Fernandez, where do you see yourself in five years and what steps will you be taking to get there? So again, I, I've, I've worked, you know, my whole career, both in my previous departments and, and since I've come here in Hingham to, to try to advance myself within, within the department and broaden my horizons. Um, you know, so hopefully if I, I, I do get a promotion within, within the next five years, um, you know, I, I'll see myself, you know, trying to, again, kind of take the, take the, you know, the view that I did when I, when I started the job and when I came to hang with, you know, kind of sitting back and learning for a little bit, um, being a fly on the wall, so to speak, and absorbing, you know, how things are done, um, and trying to, you know, develop my own way of doing things. Um, and then, you know, once, once that's, settled in and I, I, you know, you get your feet and, uh, you know, you come, you become comfortable with the position. Um, I, I see myself, you know, trying to, to, to strive for more, um, whether it's seeking out additional trainings for, you know, um, more police leadership trainings or, um, you know, specific, you know, specialized areas, what, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, more community policing type stuff. Um, but I, I always, again, it's, it's hard to kind of put into words, but I, I, I always am striving for, for advancement with, within my, my life and in my job. Um, so, you know, if I do make it to that next level, if I am, you know, granted this opportunity, um, I, I kind of see myself, you know, continually pushing to, to, to see how far I can go. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Officer Fernandez, I think I have the final question this evening. Uh, as you're aware, uh, we have uh, six very strong candidates for these positions. Uh, I wondered what, what, in your opinion, distinguishes you from the other candidates? So, uh, again, we, we do have, like you said, uh, very strong candidates for this position. Um, I, I respect all of them. I get along with all of them great. I think any of us would be a great choice. Um, I, I think what, what may, you know, what, what I can say about myself um, is that I, I do have um, just you know, that, that drive to, to better myself, to, um, you know, push myself to get to that next level. Um, I really do think that my, you know, my work towards the community policing aspect, um, you know, of the job to try to, you know, make that relationship with our community the best that it can be. Um, you know, I'm always trying to, to get us into new things where, you know, down that avenue as well. Um, you know, one of the other things that I've done is I've, I've, um, coordinated our, the Hingham component, I guess you could say, to um, Team Freeze Police for the um, Special Olympics Polar Plunge at Nantasket Beach. Um, you know, I, I kind of, when I came, I had several ideas about the community policing to get, you know, to get us more involved with the community. And, and I think our, our supervisors have been, have been great in allowing me to kind of, you know, pursue those. Um, and one other thing that, that kind of may, you know, differentiate myself is, you know, it's more of a minor thing, but um, the, the computer system that we use, it's, uh, it's called IMC. Um, and I've used it for my, my whole career. That's what I had um, down the Cape. Um, so one of the main, you know, functions of an OIC at the Hingham Police Department is, is booking. Um, and, you know, I, I have extensive knowledge in booking. You know, we booked our own prisoners down there. Um, and my help with the firearms licensing is, you know, kind of helped me with that in as well. But again, I mean, they're all, they're all great candidates. Um, you know, that there are things that um, I think um, make me, you know, a strong candidate as well. Um, and I hope I've kind of impressed upon them to you. Um, but again, uh, you can't go wrong with any, any of us. Thank you so much. 
at this point, I'd like to give you an opportunity if there are any questions you have for us or any, any final comments that you'd like to make before we conclude this evening. Um, I, I just really wanted to thank you guys um, for taking the time out to, to interview us like this. I do think that it's important. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not an easy process, but it's not intended to be. Um, so I, I do really appreciate you guys, um, you know, sitting here and taking the time to, to speak with us. Um, but I mean, I, I, I hope that I answered your questions. Uh, it can, can be kind of difficult in this setting to, you know, get what you're thinking out, out of your mouth. But um, I hope that I did, did, uh, did my best and uh, answered what you asked. So thank you very you much. Did. You did. And you know, it's, um, I always think that these interviews, uh, doing it in the public is, is a little bit challenging. We have now in this kind of Zoom format, it's, it's particularly challenging. And um, again, uh, I want to thank you for all the many contributions you've made to the Hingham community since your arrival. Uh, we appreciate your putting yourself forward for consideration. Um, and uh, we thank you very much for visiting with us this evening. It's been very nice to see you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Okay, uh, Chief Jones, who's next, please? Uh, next up, we have Officer Caitlin McGillicuddy. Good evening, Officer. How are you? Hi, good evening. Thank you for having good. me. Oh, thank you for being here this evening. Can you hear us okay? I can, yes. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you and, and welcome. Um, this evening, uh, we're going to uh, ask you to start out by introducing yourself to the board and the community, telling us a little bit about yourself, your experience, uh, what, you know, your, your interest in, in becoming a sergeant. Uh, my colleagues and I will take turns asking you a few questions, and then we'll wrap up giving you an opportunity to ask any questions or make any final comments. Uh, so with that, I'd, I'd invite you to introduce yourself to the board and also to the community. Great, thank you. So again, my name is Caitlin McGillicuddy. I've been with the Hingham Police Department for just about 10 years. I grew up in the town of Hingham and I still have family here. So my parents still live here, brother, nieces and nephews, et cetera. So I still have ties in that aspect. I went to Sacred Heart University where I got a business degree and then continued to Curry College where I got a master's degree in criminal justice. I'm now married with two kids and a third on the way. Um, my husband is a police officer and also in the National Guard. My father was a police officer in Boston for over 30 years. Um, so I've grown up in the public service um, mentality, household, et cetera. Uh, currently, since I've been in the Hingham Police Department, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to help a lot within the community events that they offer. Uh, one of my favorite things that I've done so far is the Rad Kids and Rad Women's. I've also assisted with the Family Fun Day and the Family Night Out. I was one of the tri, tri chairs, that's a tricky one, <laughs> uh, leading that, as well as the Citizens Police Academy. I've been able to not only speak there, but also assist administratively with that. I just recently was assigned to the property and evidence as um, the officer for that. And my new role as of a year ago is the school safety officer. So with the school safety officer, I'm fortunate to be with the four elementary schools where I work hand in hand with the principals and vice principals. What I do on a daily basis is uh, work with safety of the school, essentially. So I do not only teaching the kids classes on 911 or Halloween safety, et cetera, but I also work with the faculty to do lockdown drills, active shooter drills, um, and any questions that they have or any safety concerns. Um, that also adds to seven crossing guards that I supervise for the schools. Um, so I help with the payroll and do uh, scheduling, et cetera, for them. So I've been very fortunate since I've been here so far and uh, love to continue doing what I'm doing so far. Well, thank you. 
And um, before beginning with questions, I just want to um, uh, mention that I thought that the package that you put together for the board uh, was very thorough and it was particularly helpful to see um, you know, some of the commendations and some of the positive feedback that, um, that members of the community and that your fellow officers have provided. So we appreciate your, um, your putting that forward for us. Um, the, the first question, officer, if you're promoted to the position of sergeant, you're actually going to be directly supervising officers that, that are now your peers. Um, what steps are you gonna take to establish your authority and credibility while maintaining a positive wor working relationship with them? I think it's very important with any uh, supervisor or any leader is to lead by example, first and foremost, and to set out your expectations at the very beginning. Um, if I want someone to show up on time and dress properly, then I need to do that myself. And when you do that, you set your expectations up at the very beginning. I think you set your officers up for success because they know what you what you expect and you know what they want. Um, I think it's important to have a good relationship with everyone that you work with and with that you need communication. I think that's one of the foundations of uh, a good working relationship is communicating and being able to talk to each other, give positive feedback as well as negative feedback. And I can do that, you know, on a daily basis while I do roll call, meet up with the officers while I'm on shift. And after any, any call, whether it's a little call or a big call, make sure that we can give a little, you know, rundown of how I think that the call went, what we could do better, what we could do differently in the future. Thank you. Uh, Bill Ramsey? Officer McGillicuddy, thank you for your service to our community. And uh, I want to uh, particularly thank you for your work as an SRO. In thank the elementary you. Schools. Uh, as a sergeant, you will be the first line supervisor of officers who at times will make mistakes. How will you differentiate between a teachable moment and the need to take discipline while ensuring maximum transparency in department operations? I think as I, as I stated uh, previously, you need to set your expectations out right at the beginning. So I think if it's something that they know I expect them to do and they continuously make a mistake on that, well, that's something that needs to be spoken to and you know, discipline on that aspect. I think everyone makes mistakes. There's no one that's perfect, uh, although I wish I was sometimes. Uh, but I think the most important thing when you do make a mistake is to learn from that. And again, that's meeting with them, you know, talking over the situation and understanding what you could do better, what you could do worse. I know I personally on a daily basis, you know, I think I could work on public speaking. It's not my greatest asset to, to fix that. I'll go to trainings, et cetera, to try to better myself. And I could bring that along to my officers. If they're having trouble with individual parts of a call or something that they're handling, maybe try to find a training or, or work with them directly to fix that. Thank you. Uh, Joe? Yes, uh, good to meet you, Officer McGillicuddy. Um, I'm gonna follow up with a, a bit of a variant on Bill's question. Um, how would you handle a dispute among police officers? So I think it's important, uh, again, communication is key to me when you are a supervisor. Um, they need to know what, what you need from them. If there's a dispute, you, excuse me, a dispute going on between two officers, I'd almost like for them to be able to figure it out and work it out in between. If I need to intervene and separate, you know, if it's getting to another level that's not appropriate, then I would definitely have to intervene, separate them, kind of talk to them individually and explain why it's not appropriate. But I think it's important too for officers to be able to work things out between themselves. When we go to calls, we're talking to people on the, I mean, every call we go to, we're talking to someone. And you need to be able to know how to communicate with someone and work through that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Officer McGillicuddy, I wondered if you could describe some of the things you've done over the last year to build your, your knowledge and skill relative to law enforcement. Absolutely. So I have attended um, a bunch of trainings. Within the past year, I've been more focused on school resource officer, of course. So I've gone to a lot of trainings on that aspect. Um, but I think 
within that, again, I'm working with not only when I'm in the schools, I'm not working with just the students, right? I'm working with the faculty. I'm working with the parents of these students on a daily a weekly basis, I'm getting emails from parents with concerns that may not even be related to the school. It may be a help with a child uh, with behavioral issues, et cetera. So I try to extend myself out there and make myself available to handle all sorts of variety of calls. With that, I go to trainings. As I said before, um, I think it's important to have good communication skills that's why I've recently attended, you know, an instructor development class, which is essentially all public speaking and attend different trainings to make sure that I am continuously improving myself as an officer. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Um, you've been a police officer now for several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on your resume, you have a wide range of experience. Uh, if appointed a sergeant, what, if any, changes will you make to the shift that you supervise to improve operations and increase morale? Sure. I think it's no secret, especially with my resume, that I am kind of a community policing based um, police officer. I think it's extremely important. I think to work with the community, you build the trust of the community and return, it's, it's a good relationship that you build. So with that, I would like to see, you know, more events, hopefully with COVID and sooner rather than later, at least the restrictions that we can all come together and continue the Citizens Police Academy, continue the Red Kids. And I'd want to get more officers involved with that, even if it's a little bit outside of their comfort zone. And I also think uh, just working on training in general as a whole, as a, you know, as a department, it's important. I think mental health is a big issue now and learning how to deal with these situations as a department and as a whole will build us a stronger, stronger in the end. Uh, Joe? Yes, Officer McGillicuddy. Mm -hmm. Being a police sergeant is quite complex and requires a lot of patience. Please give us one example where you did not lose your cool in spite of trying circumstances. Sure, so I can think of a particular call that I had. Um, it was a mental health call that we had to go to. And we were there for quite some time and nothing seemed to be working. We wanted to get this particular party and the ambulance into the hospital safely. Um, one thing to understand with mental health calls is that it takes time. There's no brushing those situations. You gotta kind of work your way through it. And although I was there for over an hour and all you want to do is say, can you get in the ambulance and let's get going? You can't do that because you got to work with them. You don't understand what this person's going through and you want to be compassionate about that. So being able to sit there, take your time, slow things down, work through it, um, eventually led to a good outcome where they did get in the ambulance and got the help that they needed. Thank you. Um, Officer McGillicuddy, we have, um, as you know, you are one of six candidates for this position. I wondered if you could tell us what you think distinguishes you from the other candidates. Sure. I think I'm a, a, going to be a great leader. I feel as though I've already displayed that with the work that I've done so far within this department. Again, I already supervise seven crossing guards, so I'm familiar with the scheduling and making sure people are where they're supposed to be at the time they're supposed to be, et cetera. Um, but more than that, I think that my passion for the, for the job comes through and I'm motivated to do the best that I can do. Um, and I think that will brush off to the, my fellow officers, knowing that I'm excited to be there and passionate about the job that I am. It's not just a job for me, it's a career, it's a profession, and I'm very fortunate uh, to be able to, to do what I'm doing. Thank you. Uh, Bill? How will you train and mentor your subordinates to meet the challenges of modern day police work given the recently enacted legislative reforms? I think the big, biggest thing with that is training. And fortunately with the Hingham Police Department, they're right on top of that. We're so far ahead of other departments with our training. I mean, I just the other day came from a, 
uh, training on the police reform. Um, and I think that just continuously being on top of things, keeping up to date and communicating that with the officers, knowing what we're working with. I think we also have to continue to work on de-escalation and again, communication, mental health, all of that. And honestly, I think we're already a step ahead of it at the Hingham Police Department with the training that we've done. And again, just communicating with one another. Uh, and Joe, the final question this evening for Officer McGillicuddy. Yes, Officer McGillicuddy, where do you see yourself in five years time and what steps will you be taking to get there? Sure, so in five years, I mean, I hope that I am a sergeant at that time and I would love to continue my passion again is community policing. And I think uh, along with that is mental health. I would really love to, I know we, had a clinician and we're hoping to get another one sooner rather than later. I would really like to work on that aspect. I think it's important and I think it's something that is so imperative right now uh, in the world that we live in uh, with everything that's going on. So I'd like to work one-on-one -on -one with a clinician, any training that we can do. We already work on crisis intervention, anything further to make us the best that we can be when handling situations like that. As I stated before, you know, these calls take time, they take knowledge, and you gotta just slow things down. And I think it's so important to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, Officer McGillicuddy, at this point, we'd like to invite you if you have any questions for us or if there's any, if there are any closing comments that you'd like to make. I just wanna thank you all for the opportunity and allowing me to sit down with you and have this conversation. Um, I would be so proud and so fortunate if I could be a sergeant. Um, one of the, the first female sergeant uh, would be such an honor to me for the Hingham Police Department. I think I really display the passion for the job and I think I'll do a great job if I'm given that opportunity. Officer McGillicuddy, thank you so much. We appreciate um, all, the, all the many contributions you've made to the Hingham community. We appreciate your putting yourself forward for consideration. And it's really been a pleasure talking with you this evening. So uh, thank you very much and good evening. Thank you, have a great night. Uh, Chief Jones, our next candidate. Here, so next uh, up is Officer Ryan Ross. Good evening, Officer Ross. How are you this evening? Good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Can you hear us okay? I can. Oh, terrific. Well, thank you and welcome. Um, I think Chief Jones has told you uh, what we'd like to, the way we'd like to conduct this interview is ask you to take a few minutes, introduce yourself to the board and to the community. Um, my colleagues and I will take turns asking some questions and at the conclusion, we'll give you an opportunity to ask any questions of us or, you know, make any sort of summary comments. Uh, so with that, I welcome you and I'd, I'd invite you to introduce yourself to the board and to the community. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much, um, all of you, for this opportunity. It's an honor to be sitting in front of you tonight. Um, as the chief said, my name is Ryan Ross. Um, I'm going to speak about my family first. My wife and I just uh, welcomed our first child into the world in September. A little boy. Um, it was the best probably moment in my life. Don't tell Petey. But um you know, it was an unbelievable experience, it really was. Um, professionally, um, to get ready to embark in my career in law enforcement, um, I obtained my bachelor's degree from Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts. Um, while there, I had to complete three internships, um, one of which I completed here, one at the Norwell Police Department, and one at the Hull Police Department. Um, while completing my internship in Hull, I was afforded the opportunity by the chief at the time to attend the Basic Reserve Intermittent Police Academy. Um, so while I was finishing up my degree, I was actually able to work as a seasonal police officer in a special um, for three summers, um, ultimately with the, girl, the goal of um, getting hired as a full-time police officer in the town of Hingham. Um, in November of 
2010, um, I was able to achieve that goal. And I started the police academy um, where I graduated April of 2011, um, completed my field training and I've been on the road ever since. Um, while working for the town of Hingham, I've had many roles and functions within the, uh, the police department. Um, I was in the honor guard. I was in the traffic division. I was the head of the Linden Pond Citizens Police Academy. And I assisted with the, um, and still currently do, with the, um, the regular Citizens Police Academy that we run here at the station. Um, all of this, being a goal-oriented person, um, working towards my dream job of becoming a canine handler. Um, I was able to um, interview and was appointed to that position in, um, in May of 2016. Um, I was able to go with the head trainer, Sergeant Mark O'Reilly from the Department of Correction and had my partner picked out for me. And then I started the 16 week patrol school to get certified as a canine handler um, for the patrol dog um, under the guidance of Sergeant O'Reilly and obtained my certificate through the um, Plymouth County Sheriff's Office. Um, that position is one that I take a lot of pride in um, because it involves an extreme amount of dedication. Um, it helps me to go look for people that are in mental health crisis, missing people, and also suspects of crimes. But on the other side of it, it also helps me to really get community exposure. And I get to meet with all different types of groups of people and from all walks of life and explain our duties and functions day to day and you know, really get to uh, emphasize on the community policing aspect, which I really love as well. Um, so that's where I'm at currently. Um, and I, I love my job and I'm very thankful, like I said, to be sitting before you here tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll lead off with questions with Bill Ramsey. Officer Ross, uh, good to see you tonight. Um, you too, sir. I wanna thank you for your service to our community. And I want to uh, particularly point out the great work you're doing as a canine handler, um, not only um, on the law enforcement side, but also on the community side, going to the scout meetings and things like that. So thank you for that. Thank you, sir. As a sergeant, you will be the first line supervisor of officers who at times will make mistakes. How will you differentiate between a teachable moment and the need to take discipline while ensuring maximum transparency in department operations? Well, sir, I think every day we're always learning and evolving in this profession. Um, so we always have teachable moments. Um, the times that things would become un unacceptable would be obviously any time that would put, you know, the reputation of our agency in jeopardy. And from there, obviously, I would have to take the appropriate channels to um, either focus on remedial training or uh, discipline if it needed to get there. Thank you, sir. Uh, Joe? Yes, uh, Officer Ross, thank you very much for being here and for your service. Thank uh, you, sir. How would you handle a dispute among police officers if you were a supervising sergeant? A dispute, like a, an argument, sir? Yes, some sort of disagreement among police officers. I, I would separate them, speak to both of them, you know, um, let, let some, time cool off, get both sides, figure out if um, there's any discipline that's needed um, going forward, and then figure out um, hopefully how we can resolve the, the issue internally within the shift. And if not, like I said, if something more happened, something physical, then I would take the appropriate channels necessary, um, you know, and discipline action necessary. Great, thank you. Uh, good, good evening, officer. I, uh, I, I remember the day you got PD. I remember that uh, PD and Pablo were, uh, they brought him to the police station and, uh, and you and Officer Achille brought the dogs outside and there were a lot of interested people there and um, it, 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 five years has gone by very quickly. Um, if, if you're promoted to the position of Sergeant, you will be directly supervising officers who are formerly your peers. What steps will you take to establish your authority and credibility while maintaining a positive working relationship with the officers? That's an awesome question. Um, you know, that's, that's one of those things I think, um, you know, leadership comes with respect. If you do the right things, you lead by example. 
the rest will kind of fall into place. You know, I, I plan on being firm, but fair, um, you know, treating everyone equally um, and, you know, taking input when needed to, you know, get the goal or the mission at hand accomplished. Um, so separating myself, I feel as though, you know, now um, I, I kind of am in a leadership role because I'm kind of at that crossroads being here for 10, 11 years where the younger officers in the agency look to me at certain calls um, for advice or input or will debrief after the fact. Um, though I wasn't elected as a field training officer, I, I um, am lucky enough to work with Sergeant Smith to help train the new guys on the canine aspect of things and also on the road. Um, so that's one of the things that I really look forward to, um, to doing. And I, again, that comes down to respect. And I think that that will all fall in line and that'll help me separate and kind of lead the shift um, how, how I you know, deem necessary. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Officer Ross, you've been a police officer now for several years. And as your resume points out, you have a wide range of experience. If appointed a sergeant, what if any changes will you make to the shift you supervise to improve operations and increase morale? Well, thank you, sir. I, that's, a, that's also a great question. Um, you know, at this point in my career, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to work for many supervisors. Um, currently, I just came off the day shift where I was working for um, Sergeant Kilroy and now Lieutenant Marquardt, and now I currently work for Sergeant Smith. So I've seen all different types of leadership styles, and they are all unbelievable leaders. Um, you know, guys you really look to, um, and guys you're really happy that are there. Um, so going forward, I would kind of um, embed that style. Can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry, I drew a blank there. Yep. So when when you if you were to become a sergeant, yes. What if any changes would you make? to the shift you supervise to improve operations and increase morale. Okay, now, now I know where I was going with that. So under, under Sergeant Marquardt, um, we, we did a great thing pre-COVID. We would get together as a shift and we would grab a cup of coffee somewhere. We'd change the location in town. We'd get out, we'd speak to the people before our shift and then go about our daily business. I would like to do something of the same. You know, Again, relying heavily on the community involvement, um, you know, getting out there, reestablishing, you know, a firm connection with people where everyone's been isolated over the past year. I think that's very important. And to also show people that, you know, at the end of the day, we wear the uniform, but we're just like everyone else. We have families, you know, we're very friendly, we're approachable. Um, and that's, that's how I would do that on the shift. Uh, Joe? Yes, Officer Ross. Being a police sergeant is quite complex and requires a lot of patience. Please give us one example where you did not lose your cool in spite of trying circumstances. Sure. Um, so about a month ago, I got called um, to town for a, um, a juvenile male that was possibly under the influence of narcotics that was having a mental health episode. Um, and the shift had relayed to me that we had a history with this individual. And he had gotten into a verbal argument with his mother and had ran off into the woods. So obviously, you know, given the temperatures this winter, it was very cold. Um, so it was a fluid situation. And obviously we wanted to find him um, and get him the help he needed safely. Um, so uh, PD and I started off in the woods. I was able to locate the, the um, you know, the individual. And upon doing so, um, he initially didn't come out from where he was concealed in, in the woods. And obviously, you know, that can cause, pose a problem. So I was able to, you know, stay calm in the situation. I'm in the woods, you know, nighttime, you know, and I began to speak with this young gentleman and was able to get him to come out from where he was, you know, hiding. And then ultimately I squat him out and we were able to get him the help that he needed um, for the evening. So it was a positive outcome. Thank you. Uh, officer, could you please talk about what you've done over the last year to build your knowledge and your skills relative to law enforcement? Over, over the past year, um, you know, I've continued on. So in canine, um, I've been fortunate enough where we, we obviously, um, due to liability of, you know, having a patrol dog, um, we attend um, monthly in-service twice a month. Um, I also was lucky enough at the beginning of this year to um, accept a position being attached to the Metrolex SWAT team, the regional SWAT team which is unbelievable. So that gives us another training day. 
Um, so just keeping current um, with my training schedule for that, um, brushing up on laws and obviously monitoring the current events and um, you know the new guidelines that I put out. Um, that's what I've done over the past year to kind of educate and maintain. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Officer Ross, how will you train and mentor your subordinates to meet the challenges of modern day police work given recently enacted legislative reforms? Well, I, I, I honestly, I think that, um, you know, the reform is like anything, um, you know, it's, it's about coming in and doing the job the right way, leading by example, um, you know, so in my eyes, really with that, um, the sky isn't falling, you know, nothing, nothing has really changed. I mean, we have a mission at hand and that is to, you know, put the best product that we can out on the street, serve this community, get involved with this community. And th those are all things that I plan on doing going forward, so. Uh, Joe? So I've got the last question, I think, but before I ask it, I just wanna note that I think, uh, Officer Ross, you and I have two things in common. First is our love of dogs. And second, I think we uh, have the same hairstyle. Um, uh, my question is, where do you see yourself in five years time and what steps will you be taking to get there? Thank you, sir. Um, you know, I, like, as I mentioned before, I've always been the type of person that's goal oriented um, since I started my adventure in law enforcement. And I say adventure because that's exactly what it is day to day. Um, and I love it. Um, in five years, um, I would love to be, you know, in a leadership role at this, at this, you know, within the agency. Um, I think that that would be great. Um, even though now I feel like I kind of am, like I said, we're in that transition period where I've, I have younger guys looking to me, but to have something concrete would be, would be amazing. Um, and, you know, continue on the path with um, what I'm doing canine wise. I love that. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be in that position. So in five years time, hopefully, you know, I, I'll, like I said, I'll be in some, uh, some type of leader, leadership capacity um, to answer your question directly. Thank you, sir. Uh, and officer, I think I have the final question this evening. As you're aware, you are one of six candidates for these two positions. What distinguishes you from the other candidates? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, you know, all the candidates that you have spoken with and are going to speak with are, are unbelievable police officers. Um, as you saw from the lieutenant's interviews, you know, or even the chief's interviews, we've had so much turnover, but um, this agency from top to bottom is, is top notch. Um, so, you know, it's, I'm, I have some tough competition, but I would say um, given the current position that I'm in, that kind of separates me from the other candidates because I'm entrusted with, you know, a role that requires, you know, I would say the most dedication um, to this agency and to this town because of, of my position, um, you know, being on call 24 um, seven, you know, obviously PD comes home with me, you know, he lives with my family. Um, you know, we have to train every day. Um, we really, unless I go on vacation in Kenilm, we don't have a day off. So I think kind of that work ethic um, would separate me from the other candidates um, going forward. But like I said, um, they're unbelievable candidates. I'd be happy to work for, um, for any of them. And uh, again, I'm just very thankful to have this opportunity, so. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'd invite you if you have any questions for us or if there's anything that you'd like to say in closing. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I, I just want to say to everyone, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm, I, I'm, every day I get up, I'm very excited about my job, very thankful to have my job. Um, and I really appreciate um, the support from the board. Um, it's been outstanding. So thank you all very much. And uh, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, well, officer, we thank you. We thank you for your many contributions uh, to the Hingham community. We thank you for putting yourself forward for consideration for this role. Uh, we congratulate you and your wife on your new son. Thank you. um, it's been a big, it's been a big year. Um, so we thank you very much and we wish you a good evening. You as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Chief Jones, if you could maybe introduce our next candidate. Certainly. Next up, we have um, Officer Jerry Sullivan. Good 
Good evening, Officer Sullivan. How are you tonight? Good evening. How are you? Good, thank you. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Terrific. Well, welcome. We appreciate your being here this evening. Um, we're going to invite you to introduce yourself to the board and to the community. Tell us a little bit about yourself, why you're interested in becoming a sergeant. Um, my colleagues and I will take turns asking some questions. And at the conclusion, we'll give you an opportunity to ask any questions of us or make any final comments. So uh, with, with that, I'd invite you to introduce yourself to the board and to the community. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Sullivan. I've been a Hingham resident for a little over 30 years. Uh, I reside in the community. I've been a Hingham police officer for 12 and a half years. Uh, from a young age, um, I had examples of leadership and service um, in my family. Uh, my uncle was a Hingham police officer in the 80s, uh, patrol officer on the midnight shift, and then a uh, Hingham police sergeant. Uh, my grandmother was heavily involved in the archdiocese. Um, so growing up, I had a lot of examples of uh, service and leadership. Uh, played town sports, uh, graduated from Hingham High School. During high school, uh, the events of September 11th occurred. Um, that kind of solidified uh, what I wanted to do with my career um, and going forward in life. I sought different ways to um, obtain employment in law enforcement. I took the ASVAB, contemplated going into the military. I sought a uh, bachelor degree from UMass Boston. Uh, during that time, I interned with the Quincy Police Department I uh, was made a lot of connections and bonds. Um, some of the men and women at the Quincy Police Department I'm still in contact with. It was a great experience. While I was in college, I had the opportunity to join the Hingham Police Department. I left um, UMass Boston at that time. I completed the police academy in 2008. I finished up my bachelor's in 2011, I believe. Um, I sought a little further education, um, obtaining my master's degree in 2018. Um, since joining the department, I look to uh, immerse myself in uh, learning every aspect of the job, um, practical use in terms of um, FIO and people, field interrogation, observation, uh, looking to make either arrests, criminal complaints, traffic stops. Um, in the practical sense, I sought leadership roles um, in terms of uh, expanding my role and responsibility, uh, seeking out uh, FTO employment, I became an FTO field training officer. Um, I be, eventually became uh, union president uh, and co-director of the uh, Civilian Police Academy. Those things have been very rewarding in different ways, different experiences. Um, and additionally, um, in, in my union president role, I, I sought to engage the community in um, several community uh, service events, get my officers out in the public, uh, playing clothes, dialogue, interacting with um, members of the community. So they did, just didn't see us in a police uniform. Um, I am a father. Um, I have a beautiful wife at home. She's watching uh, three great kids. I'm raising them in the town of Hingham. Um, they're being educated here. Finally, they're back to school full time. I know that's a relief for a lot of people and I'm sure you guys are relieved as well. Um, and thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm just thoroughly invested uh, both in the community and the department, and, uh, just looking to uh, become a resource for younger officers and uh, moving the department forward. Thank you, Officer Sullivan. Um, I think we'll lead up with questions with uh, Joe Fisher. Yes, Officer Sullivan. Um, thank you for your service and you know, thank you for stepping up and be willing to, uh, to go for the Sergeant position, much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Um, if you get that position, you will um, have supervisory responsibilities. How would you handle a dispute among police officers? I would, uh, I'd first look to um, speak with, obviously separate the officers um, and speak with them personally, look to find out what the, the basis of the dispute is um, and look to mediate it, obviously. Uh, the officers at the department and, and my coworkers, we we pride ourselves on being professional. Uh, communication is key, both on the job, in life, 
and especially at the leadership role, clear, concise communication expectations. Um, and we're not always going to get along or agree on, on certain aspects, but at the end of the day, our mission is to serve the community and we need to do it at a high level. So I would ensure that both officers are aware of that um, and look to just mediate and uh, smooth out whatever differences I could. Great, thank you. Um, officer, if, uh, if you are promoted to the position of Sergeant, you're going to be directly supervising officers who were formerly your peers. What steps will you take to establish your authority and credibility while maintaining a positive working relationship? It's a great question. I, I've, I've been working on this for 12 years. Um, I've always looked to be a resource and an asset to both my shift and the department as a whole. Um, through the various roles that I've had, whether it be FTO, or um, in the union president role, the FTO has direct supervision of a recruit, a lot of responsibility. Um, it's incumbent up upon the FTO to make sure that the recruit officer is competent in criminal law, constitutional law, traffic law, um, and effectively communicates with the community and officers um, in the department. And by clearly establishing what I expect of them, what the department and the community expects of them, um, it helps, helps facilitate that process. Um, if I became a Sergeant, um, the officers that I work with, they know the amount of time that I put in. They know the various roles that I've held. Uh, they know that at the end of the day, I want what's best for both the, the officers and the community as a whole. That's, that's the end game for me. Um, we have a mission or professional setting clear expectations and just being professional about it um, and, a, and a good communicator. I, I believe that they would follow me. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Dr. Sullivan, thank you for your uh, service to our community and also for your work as the, um, the union president. Um, as you noted, uh, the union's done a lot with outreach in the community and it's it's wonderful to see it, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, as a Sergeant, you will be the first line supervisor of officers who at times will make mistakes. How will you differentiate between a teachable moment and the need to take discipline while ensuring maximum transparency in department operations? I guess I would, uh, I'd start off with, uh, with a quote, mistakes of the heart can be corrected uh, excuse me, mistakes of the mind can be corrected. Mistakes of the heart cannot be corrected. So evaluating the mistakes that are made, um, if we have a mistake of the heart and an integrity issue, something that's going to uh, erode either public trust, erode the, the police legitimacy, then that is going to need to be documented um, and handled swiftly and, and very quickly. Um, it's a mistake of uh, just lack of resources or, or uh, knowledge. We can work with that, um, whether it be remedial training, one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetups and just reviewing different chapters and sections or policy and procedure. Um, but a very hands-on approach, obviously reviewing um, reports, responding to calls, playing an active role in um, the officer's day-to-day -day business is all, uh, all a sergeant would, would be involved with. Um, it's important to um, monitor, monitor these things and, and levy uh, and any sort of feedback or constructive criticism um, appropriately and, and uh, in a timely manner. Uh, Joe, another question for Officer Sullivan? Yes, Officer Sullivan. Uh, being a police sergeant uh, is quite complex and requires a lot of patience. Please give us one example where you did not lose your cool in spite of trying circumstances. So over the, over the, past, over the past several years, we've had um, 
a lot of a lot of instances um, with individuals testing police officers, um, testing our uh, professionalism, um, making making things a little difficult on us. But if I can speak to one one particular incident, I um, I was responding to a domestic uh, assault and battery, and I was uh, had enough probable cause for an arrest of an individual, which he was uh, placed in handcuffs, but he had been in the criminal justice system before. And he told me that he wasn't going to go into the back of the police cruiser. He swore that he would never get back on the car, uh, the, the rear of the police car for transport again. Um, and he had made a promise and, and he was a, he was a larger man, uh, well, physically built strong guy. Uh, but Having three kids, um, having three younger siblings, I'm I'm a pretty patient individual. I I just out outweighed him. Um, clear communication, walking him through why I'm doing this, why this needs to be done. Um, that's I I eventually had a, a really good rapport with this with this individual. Uh, it took a little time, but at 12:30, uh, quarter of one in the morning. All, all we have is time. Um, no force options needed to be used. Uh, no, no tools. Just communication. Explaining him why I'm here. I, I explained from start to beginning. Explained the improbable cause, the elements that led up to where we were. And I find the more you communicate, and the more you explain processes uh, to civilians, the more uh, cooperation you'll get. Because a lot of times, folks won't know exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, so I have no problem telling them and trying to diffuse and calm them down a little bit because um, it must be nerve wracking to have your civil liberties taken away for a short period of time like that, um, be put into handcuffs and whatnot. So I, I'm aware of that. So I, just communication and, and patience um, served me well in that instance. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Officer Sullivan, I wondered if you could talk about things you've done over the last year to build your skills and knowledge relative to law enforcement? So over the, over the past year, um, I've taken um, some training. One, I, one of them was online, I believe. It was um, understanding cultural norms for 911 dispatchers and police officers. And the course was, um, the primary goal was to, you know, step out of your comfort zone understand that what I think is normal may not be normal for um, other ethnicities, religious backgrounds, and not obviously jump to conclusions or um, recognize and, and try to understand um, differences. And I feel that at our department, um, training is paramount. It's at the forefront of what we do. And I, I feel like that has helped us um, immensely, especially as the last uh, several years have been trying in the profession. Um, but constantly uh, communicating, training um, has, has helped out a lot. Uh, several other of my trans uh, trainings were canceled due to COVID, unfortunately. Um, and several of my community events that I was looking to uh, have done were canceled as well but we should be looking out for those in 2022. Um, when they come around, obviously everyone will be informed uh, appropriately. Thank you. Uh, Bill, another question? You've been a police officer for several years and as your resume indicates, you have a wide range of experience. If appointed a sergeant, what if any changes will you make to the shift you supervise to improve operations and increase morale? If I was um, appointed, I'd be looking to um, gain the trust and the, uh, the confidence of the men and women under my charge. Um, I've looked to, as I stated earlier, I've looked to demonstrate that through my career um, to be an asset, have uh, individuals come with me a question, with questions. Uh, specifically to answer your question, um, I would employ a transactional 
one of my, one of my management styles would be a transactional leadership style. And we, we are a data driven department. Officers are well aware of that. Um, I'd look to set goals in accordance with um, our department mission and our uh, department goals, set goals clear and clear and concisely um, and reward good police work and good community interactions and efforts. It doesn't necessarily have to be an arrest. It doesn't have to be a traffic stop. It could be a positive um, community interaction with youth, with the elderly. And as officers demonstrate this and continue to demonstrate, I'd reward that with proactive assignments, um, special assignments, whether um, if the manning allowed a bike patrol, maybe an officer could take out an un undercover uh, vehicle, unmarked vehicle, um, to do some proactive enforcement, whether it be retail theft or uh, traffic enforcement. Um, and I would seek out uh, different training opportunities and recommend them to, to officers that were interested. Um, having a dialogue with your officers as well as the community goes a long way. You know, we need to check in on each other. We need to know how we're doing, what we're interested in to, um, to be effective and serve the community uh, completely and fully. Uh, Joe, another question? Yes, officer. Where do you see yourself in five years time and what steps will you be taking to get there? Five years, I, I hope to be uh, maybe taking a lieutenant's interview, uh, speaking with you or the, the uh, future selectmen. Um, in terms of how I'm gonna get there, um, I interviewed before the board two years ago. Unfortunately, I wasn't selected. After that, I sought more opportunities. Um, I was elected to the union president in, in March of 2019. When I came into that role, I wanted to focus on the community, um, expand our efforts a little bit. Like I said in uh, the intro, I wanted to um, take a proactive approach to the union and get out into the community, have individuals see us in plain clothes, interact with us in a, in a more casual setting. Um, and I was, I was planning on having a charity softball game with um, Fred Smarlis' company, uh, Patriots players versus the Hingham police. COVID naturally uh, killed that, but we're going to work to that. So going in the future, I would um, seek out more responsibility, further trainings uh, naturally, just to expand my knowledge base, my knowledge, skills, and abilities. And I'll just keep banging on the door. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, officer, uh, as you as you're aware, uh, you are one of six candidates for these uh, two open positions, and I wondered if if you could maybe just uh, talk to us a little bit about what you think distinguishes you from the other candidates. It's a very difficult question. Um, the candidate field here is um, experienced; uh, they're solid. I have a lot of respect. Uh, for the candidate field, and I'll be able to work closely with them if I'm not selected. I think what would separate me um, is my commitment and my devotion to both the department and the community. I live here. My family lives here. I have extended family here. I have a thorough investment in the success of both the agency and, and the town as a whole. Um, and my wife could attest to the amount of hours that I'm here, you know, early in the morning or at a moment's notice that I have to leave for a meeting or some sort of emergency, a critical incident, um, you know, and she really bears the front of that and like the weight with, with the children. Um, so obviously I'm extremely fortunate, but I, overall, um, just very committed, um, selfless and, you know, regardless if I'm selected here, I'm going to continue operating this matter, uh, in this manner. Uh, but that, that's kind of just who I am and, and what separates me. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, the final question uh, from Bill Ramsey, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Officer Sullivan, how will you train and mentor your subordinates to meet the challenges of modern day police work given recently enacted legislative reforms? So when I first joined the police department, it was 2008, Marijuana had just been decriminalized. Um, somewhere around, I believe, 2015, 2016, it was legalized. 2018, we had juvenile reform. And 
2020, we have uh, criminal justice reform. But going back to 2008, our department has been training. Our department has been training, um, I think at the forefront, looking for best practices in the policing profession. Um, we've made de-escalation um, use of force options in terms of de-escalation, uh, communication, bringing in mental health experts, less lethal, all, all, it's, it's a broad spectrum. And we've made a, a focus and a strong effort to minimizing um, harm on, on suspects when feasible, and which is, which is very important. It's better for all parties involved. Um, and if I were to lead and explain this to the younger officers under my charge, I would, I would tell them we're operating as, as we've operated for the past 12 and a half years that I've been here. We're going to continue to support you. We're going to give you the tools and the knowledge that you're going to need to be successful. And we're going to work together and we're going to work with the community in, in achieving, um, you know, a high quality of life, a high standard of life, reducing the fear of crime, uh, reducing crime and, and disorder. We're, we're all in it together. We're going to work together and continue to be on the forefront of the training aspect, I believe. Officer Sullivan, um, at this point, we'd invite you if you have any questions for us or there's anything you'd like to say in closing uh, before we wrap up tonight, the floor is yours. I'd just like to thank the board. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, the, the conversations that have occurred over the last year um, are definitely enlightening and they're, um, and they're good. I'm, I'm glad we're having conversations and continuing to work together. Uh, it's a great community and I don't want to take up any of your, uh, your time because I know how busy you are and you do a great job. So I just like to thank you. Uh, well, thank you. You know, Officer Sullivan, we want to take this opportunity to thank you for the many contributions you've made to this community, both as a member of the police department um, as an, and, and as an engaged citizen. Um, we also know that um, working for the town of Hingham, it's, it's not just an individual commitment, it's a family commitment. And it's nice to hear you acknowledge the, the support uh, that, that you're getting from your family, which is terrific. Uh, we also appreciate your putting yourself forward for consideration for this evening. Um, you all are making our job very difficult, um, but uh, just appreciate the chance to visit with you tonight to hear a little bit about more about what you've been doing. Um, so we thank you and we wish you a good evening. Thank you. Have a good night. And Chief Jones, our final candidate for this evening. Sure, so last but certainly not least is uh, Phil Tracy. Detective Tracy, good evening, welcome. Good evening. Good evening, can you hear us okay? I can, thank you. And you can hear Terrific. me? Terrific. Thank you. We can. Thank you. Well, welcome <laughs> and um, uh, thank you. Thank you for being patient as we've um, as we've had an opportunity to visit with some of your colleagues. Uh, this evening, we're going to start off. We're going to ask you if you could please introduce yourself to the board and the community. Talk a little bit about your background, your experience, why you're interested in the sergeant position. Uh, my colleagues and I will take turns asking some questions. And at the conclusion, uh, we'll, we'll offer you the opportunity to ask questions of us or make any sort of concluding, uh, concluding remarks. So with that, I would, um, I would invite you to introduce yourself to the board and to the community, if you could, please. Sure, my name is Phil Tracy. Um, I've been with the, uh, with the Hingham Police Department for 22 years now. Um, I actually grew up in Whitman with uh, my parents and my four brothers. Um, after, uh, after graduating college uh, at Massasoit um, with my associates in criminal justice, um, I started looking towards a career in law enforcement. Um, I ended up landing in Hingham, um, renting a house for a few years, 
um, took the test and ended up getting, getting lucky enough to get an interview. Um, I was hired in 1998, graduated the academy in 1999. Um, after graduation, um, I was married, started a family, bought a house, um, just like the rest of the young officers. Um, early on in my career, um, I, I decided to go back to school and finish my bachelor's degree, which I eventually did. I finished up at uh, Curry in uh, 2006. Um, I started off um, pretty early on becoming a, a field training officer with the department. Uh, at the time, it was a little bit more unofficial um, until we formalized the whole, the whole program um, and sent everybody out for training, which I did do. Um, after field training, I started field training. I also um, became a motorcycle officer um, in 2004. Um, I was a union official for, for several years. Um, I was the treasurer of the Patrolman's Union, vice president and president at, at one point. Um, became a traffic officer, went to uh, crash reconstruction school, which is a six weeks six week class um, that taught us how to uh, basically recreate crash scenes, which was uh, an interesting class. Um, I joined the honor guard in the mid 2000s. Um, I've represented the, the town of Hingham and, and the police department um, in Washington, D.C. at Police Week, um, many Fourth of July parades, um, and many other events, um, including a Red Sox game um, Sunday night with the, uh, against the Yankees in center field. That was pretty cool. Um, from there, um, I moved on to uh, eventually becoming uh, a detective in 2013, um, where... Uh, and that's where I am today. Um, it's probably been the most rewarding part of my career, uh, being a detective. I, I certainly uh, was able to uh, do a lot of training, uh, meet a lot of uh, uh, detectives and law enforcement officials from other 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 departments, um, different regions, without throughout the region, uh, federal agents, um, all kinds of interesting things. Um, and that's where I'm at today. Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, but before starting with some questions, I just wanted to take a moment and compliment you on the professionalism of the materials that you put forward for the board's consideration. Um, detailing all of the training and field experience that you have, as well as uh, letters of commendation um, from law enforcement agencies, from colleagues, from supervisors, um, a very, very impressive package. And thank you for putting it together. It was helpful preparation for us for this evening. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so detective, if you're, if you are, um, if you assume the sergeant role, you're going to be directly supervising officers and, um, you know, some of them have been your peers over the course of your career. You, you obviously interact with them in a different way in your capacity as a, as a, um, as a detective, but in, in the role of a sergeant, you know, re regardless of how you've interacted, you have to establish kind of authority and credibility while still maintaining a positive working relationship. Um, how do you see yourself doing that? Well, I, I think just by the nature of, of the job that I'm doing now as detective, um, I take the lead in a lot of the investigations. Um, if it's my investigation, I start it from start to finish. And a lot of times it starts with patrol, um, a lot of times I'm on scene with them when the investigations start, uh, whether it be crime scene, um, photographs or, or interviews. Um, I end up having to supervise uh, in some capacity, um, not as a supervisor, but just by the nature of me being in charge of the investigation. Um, I'm almost halfway there. Um, I'm slightly removed from the patrol division right now because we're upstairs um, you know, looking at things from a different lens, so to speak. Uh, we, uh, we are already removed, so I don't think it'll be a problem. Um, and, I, and I feel the leadership role anyway. Thank you. Uh, Bill, a question for Detective Tracy? Uh, Detective Tracy, thank you for your uh, service to our community. Um, thank you for your, your work as a detective. And, I, I think it's great that you and your brother serve the, the town together on the police department. So it is kind of nice. I actually like working with him. He's a great kid. He's a good cop. It's nice. Um, as a sergeant, you will be the first line supervisor of officers. 
who at times will make mistakes. How will you differentiate between a teachable moment and the need to take discipline while ensuring maximum transparency in department operations? An honest mistake is an honest, honest mistake. And most people, when you point it out uh, and address it with them, they will acknowledge that and they'll see it for what it is, a teachable moment. Most people will learn looking forward. They won't make the mistake again. But the person that continues to, to I don't want to say do things on purpose, but continues to make those errors, if it's an error in judgment um, and whatnot, they might need discipline. And that might be the way that, they, that you have to handle it. Right, Joe? Yes, uh, Officer Tracy, uh, good to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. Um, if you're promoted to sergeant, how would you handle a dispute among police officers? Hmm. I guess you would uh, have to hear both sides, try to figure out what really happened, try to stay on the right side of it, um, coach both sides. If there's one, one side that you think is wrong, address the issue uh, and move forward. Great, thank you. Um, detective, if, if you think back over the last year, what are some things that you've done to build your skills and knowledge relative to law enforcement? Um, ever, ever since I've, I've um, been with the Hingham Police Department, I've strived for career development um, and, and taking classes. Um, as you can see from my resume, the, the different courses that I have taken, um, it's been ongoing since I, I walked in the door and it's fairly consistent. Um, I just recently took a, a, a search warrant class um, that was geared towards, uh, towards electronic uh, media, cell phones uh, and things of that nature. Um, so learned a lot from the class, um, I enjoyed it. And uh, that's what I've been, when, been doing since I've been here. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Uh, Detective Tracy, you've been a police officer for several years, and as your resume points out, you have a wide range of different experiences within the department. If appointed a sergeant, what, if any, changes will you make to the shift you supervise to improve operations and to increase morale? Well, I think, I think by the skill set that I've acquired, um, being a detective and taking all the classes that I have, I think it, it brings uh, um, a different view to the shift. So if, we, if I am with them um, on the road and I point something out that, that I can teach my shift, teach my guys um, how, to, how to look for certain evidence, how to collect it, um, maybe how to interview somebody, uh, any tips that I can give them uh, would certainly help going forward with them um, so that we can grow as a unit. Um, the, the more knowledge that I can spread to everybody that is on the police department makes the whole police department better, not just any one person, which is great. Uh, Joe? Yes, uh, D Detective Tracy. Being a police sergeant is quite complex and requires a lot of patience. Give us one example where you did not lose your cool in spite of trying circumstances. Hmm. Well. I, uh, I recently had a, uh, a victim come into the police station um, and they wanted to report uh, uh, something that happened to them. I, I won't get into the specifics because it was fairly recent, but um, they started off the, um, the interaction with, um, I hate the police, I don't trust them, I've had nothing but bad experiences with them. So the nature of the, of the report in itself was, was trying enough but to have the person lead off with that, it was difficult. And I spent about a half an hour trying to um, get them to earn my trust before I could even get into the real reason why they were there. Um, and I was successful in that endeavor and um, it turned out to be a pleasant experience. Um, I, I won the trust of, of the person and um, led to a successful case uh, on her behalf. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh Detective, uh, as you're aware, you are one of six candidates for these two positions. I wondered if you could speak to what, what in your mind distinguishes you from the other candidates. I think it's um, my 22 years of credible service um, and my continued, my continued education uh, and training and my commitment to not only the residents of Hingham, but the Hingham Police Department and my peers. 
Um, I think I possess good leadership skills, good organizational skills. I'm very thorough with my investigations. Um, I'm very fair and impartial. Um, and I give everything that I can. And I think that um, my commitment will put me above that, the rest of the group. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Dr. Tracy, how will you train and mentor your subordinates to meet the challenges of modern day police work given recently enacted legislative reforms? Well, that's the trick, isn't it? Um, I, when I started off um, as a field training officer, it was all about mentorship. It was all about leading by example, um, holding ourselves um, to a higher standard. Um, and I, I would impart that on my subordinates, but I would also make sure that they, they have the tools necessary, that they have the training that they need, the materials that they need, and that they don't make mistakes by going to the calls and making sure that they're, they're rising above it. Um, and following the rules that we don't make. We don't make those rules. They're, they're, the legislation does, um, and they're the ones that we have to follow. So I'll make sure that my guys are doing that. Uh, and Joe, the final question for Detective Tracy this evening. Yes, uh, Detective Tracy. Where do you see yourself in five years time and what steps will you be taking to get there? Well, I think it'll be the continued steps that I already am. Um, I think. I will continue to educate myself uh, and train. Um, hopefully, I would. Uh, hopefully, I see myself as a lieutenant. Um, I'd really like to do the sergeant thing first, though. Great, thank you. You're welcome, um, Sergeant. At this point, I would invite you if you have any questions for us, or if there are any um, kind of closing comments that you'd like to make uh, before we conclude this evening. Um, I, I don't have uh, any questions for you. Um, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, I am happy to be here. Um, I know that uh, I didn't grow up in this town. I came from, I, like I said, I grew up in Whitman with my family. Um, I was given a great opportunity when I got here in 1999. Uh, I was given all kinds of opportunities to take classes, to better myself, to grow with the department. Um, I, I, I'm proud to be a hanging police officer and I have an allegiance to the department. And I want to see it get better and better every day. And I know it will with the, with the current administration that we have. I'm looking forward to it. And I thank you for your time. Uh, well, Detective Tracy, thank you. Thank you for your service to the town. Um, you've obviously taken advantage of a lot of different opportunities to improve yourself and thereby serve the community better. And we are so appreciative. We also appreciate your putting yourself forward for consideration uh, for, for the sergeant role. And um, we thank you very much for joining us. It was nice to speak with you this evening and we wish you a good evening. Thank you, you too. Chief Jones, um, I have been so struck over the last two hours at the caliber of uh, the character, the skill and the commitment of the six men and women who have come before us this evening. Um, I think it's indicative of the culture of the police department, a focus on development, a focus on giving people opportunities to prepare themselves for that next level. Um, this is going to be a very, very difficult decision. Um, they seem to be getting more difficult um, and yet at the same time, I think it's, it's just an indication of the strength of our police department. And um, I, I just can't say enough about the sense of pride that I feel not only in my role, but as, as a citizen. And I think that's due to, uh, it's due to your leadership. It's due to the leadership of your predecessors. Um, this has just been so impressive. Bill and Joe, I don't know if you have any comments for the chief. I, I, I got to tell you, this is going to be exceptionally tough. You've, you've really put forward uh, a slate of candidates who are all worthy, in my view. Um, and uh, I wish we had more slots. Um, and uh, it's a real compliment to the department how how the depth is um, and the quality of, of people who are serving this town, um, sometimes without, without accolades, um,
but we need to recognize them and the contributions that they've made. So, so thanks for, for putting together this slate. Yeah, I would just echo uh, Joe's comments that I, the, the excellent candidates we heard tonight and as well as the a Lieutenant applicant to speak to the tremendous talent um, that exists within the Hingham Police Department. Great, thank you all very much. I'm incredibly humbled to be able to leave this agency and I'm just incredibly proud also, uh, like you said, Mary, of the caliber of officers and employees that we have working for us. It's, uh, and you, you just, you just got a small window into, into the men and women that work here and they're all just as uh, impressive as the officers that you saw uh, this weekend during the lieutenant's interviews. Absolutely. And so for the, you know, for members of the public uh, uh, that, you know, as, as we've outlined in the past, you know, there's th this process actually has several components to it. Um, and this is one part. And uh, over the next few weeks at an upcoming board of selectmen meeting, uh, Chief Jones will be back to make recommendations for the board uh, who will ultimately be making the two appointments. So, um, you know, we, we thank you chief for, and, and deputy chief for, uh, you know, for, for executing this part of the process so well, and we'll look forward to uh, re reconvening in an upcoming meeting to, uh, to, to, to hear your recommendations for appointments. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would also just invite members of the public and thank you for taking the time to uh, watch these interviews to the extent that members of the public have uh, input on, you know, the, the interviews that you've seen. Um, you should feel free to send an email to members of the board. Our email addresses are on the website. I would remind people that all correspondence received by the town are considered public records. But one, one reason why we don't make the appointments tonight is both to give us time for consideration and to create a window uh, should interested citizens like to express their views about, about candidates. Uh, we have two remaining pieces of business, uh, public comment on items not on the agenda. Uh, seeing none, uh, Selectman and Town Administrator reports. Tom? Not tonight, thank you, Mary. Uh, Michelle? Not tonight, thanks, Mary. Uh, Joe. I'll be brief. Uh, yesterday, the MBTA Fiscal and Management Control Board met. Uh, question about uh, what's going to happen with the MBTA service with ferry and uh, Greenbush service. Um, they noted that uh, the MBTA is expecting about $845 million from the latest round of federal stimulus money. And that's on top of the $1.1 billion in previous federal aid that was received. Uh, the board voted to resume full subway and bus service, weekend commuter rail service where it was cut and ferry service that was cut, quote, as soon as possible without defining a specific timeline. So we are still on the current restricted service, uh, no weekend service on Greenbush, uh, but there is growing pressure to uh, get the service restored as soon as possible. That's it. Maybe we could make Receiving the money contingent on restoring the service. That'll, I'd be up for that. that'll, that'll light a fire. <laughs> uh, Joe, anything else? Nope. Thank you. Phil? Yeah, yes. Yesterday was National uh, Vietnam War Veterans Day. And we have quite a few Vietnam veterans in our community, both active in our veterans organizations and not. I just wanted to um, recognize their service and say welcome home. Else. Thank you. Um, I, I just have one item. Um, you know, with the good with the good weather approaching and um, and the days getting a little bit longer, uh, we're all being able to take advantage of outdoor space in Hingham. Um, uh, I know that the board and the town has received um, correspondence and input from people with respect to um, trash in the square. Uh, I wanted to just let folks know that we are working in conjunction with the building owners in the square, the tenants in the square, uh, the downtown merchants, the downtown association and public works on a solution. Um, we are also, uh, Tom and I spoke today about also just taking into account the fact that when the beach house, that's the snack shack down at the harbor opens up, 
um, that again, with current COVID restrictions, um, a lot of people are taking, are, are not able to enjoy their food right on the spot. And so we're talking about um, uh, work, working, working with the various constituencies on, uh, on trash removal, on trash cans. But I would also just point out to members of the public, we all have, we all have some responsibility in this. And um, I would urge people, particularly if you're downtown, um, you know, you, you, you take a beverage or an ice cream cone and you're walking around the square, um, please find a trash can to dispose of your, to dispose of your litter. Um, if the can is full, if it looks like putting that one more piece in is, is gonna blow away, um, we would ask you maybe you could please just take it, take it home with you and dispose of it there. Uh, this is something that we're going to be working on over the next few weeks as the weather improves. Um, but we we would ask for everybody to um, to sort of do their part to keep these beautiful parts of our town uh, free from litter and debris. Uh, so with that, I think that concludes our meeting for this evening. Uh, I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Joe? Aye. Bill? Aye. Mary? Aye.